Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well. What a lovely morning to wake up to this morning. So I think we have a lovely, uh, warm, sunny weekend ahead of us, which is something to look forward to after we finish here today, of course. The Marie Keating Foundation would like to extend a warm welcome to you all. Um, and this is our fourth annual BRCA webinar, um, keeping us all connected and honoring, oh, sorry, I just need to move this on. Honoring um, the time we give to you every year at this time of year. So thank you for being with us this morning. Who would have thought we would still be in a world um, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic? I remember this time last year was our first big webinar and it was a huge achievement for us, but yet we're still here um, learning and thriving as we go. But there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Safe and effective vaccines will be the game changer, but for the foreseeable, we must remain safe, wearing masks, physically distancing, and avoiding crowds. We have a virtual crowd of almost 170 people here today. We are delighted to be with you every step of the way. I am Helen Forrest, the Director of Nursing Services. So let's get the housekeeping out of the way to start with. As you know, we have a morning session and an afternoon session today, and they're, they're both separate links. So we'll talk about that again a little bit later on. Um, so make sure this is your time and that it's uninterrupted for you. It's so important, I think, you know, to give yourself a little bit of time for you. Turn off your phone or silence it. Make sure you can see the screen and that you can hear the speakers. Um, and also make sure that you're sitting comfortably, but remember to get up and move as well from time to time because we're here until about half one today. Um, as an attendee, you know you don't have the ability to speak or turn on your video. But we would love you to participate in whatever way you can by asking questions. This is a great opportunity to ask questions. And in fact, some people feel far more comfortable asking questions online than they do in person. So this is your opportunity. You will find a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Click into this and type your question and then hit the return or enter key. Um, we will receive your question. Um, and we will answer it at the end of the morning session, which, which is the Q&A session dedicated to answering your, your questions. Um, if you like a particular question that's been asked um, and, you, and it's something you want to ask yourself, you can actually use the like icon, which is like the face like icon, and that will actually push that question further up to the top of the queue. Um, this morning session has been recorded. Um, and we will have an on-demand video circulated to you next week. Um, this will be shared by you channel, um, tube, you, sorry, YouTube channel. Um, but just to note that the breakout sessions are private, so we will, we will not be recording them for that reason. It would also be nice to give you an idea of who is in our audience this morning. So welcome to our colleagues from MSD and AstraZeneca our committed sponsors for our annual series of webinars and seminars. Thank you so much for your support. I would love to give a special shout out to Dr. Reem Salman, Roisin Prizman, and Michael Farrell, who we consider co-founders of this annual event um, year on year. Our Marie Keating Foundation team, our peer-to-peer -peer volunteer supporters um, who have engaged with the Marie Keating Foundation over the last three years, working very hard to support people in Ireland, women mainly, um, with a BRCA mutation. And I'd also like to welcome the World Ovarian Cancer Day commit Committee, a group of many interested organisations, some of whom you will know, who support ovarian cancer patients, and a reminder that World Ovarian Cancer Day is coming up on the 8th of May. So light up in teal to acknowledge the day and get that conversation going too. Lynch Syndrome Ireland worked tirelessly, um, Pat Fahey, Roberta Horgan, um, to advocate for those vulnerable people. I'd like to acknowledge our healthcare professionals. We have total respect for their contribution to the pandemic in the last year and more. And you who have been affected in some way by a BRCA alteration and understand what it is like for you and your family um, families to live through this, and we'll, we'll be hearing from Lisa later on this. You will all have received an agenda um, for when you when you registered, 
now. Um, so our experts will share insights on a wide range of topics, including BRCA services in Ireland, um, genetic counselling and the psycho social and psychological impact of a BRCA gene mutation. Also included in the day's events is something new and an opportunity to delve into the more niche and personal topics related to a BRCA experience, such as fertility, communication within families and menopause, which is always a hot topic and a much sought after subject. The last 12 months have been especially challenging for those beginning or currently navigating a BRCA journey. The demand for our BRCA services has grown exponentially um, and this is reflected in the numbers uh, registered today. So we are here reaching out and supporting you. It's often referred to as the Angela Jolene um, gene, as you know, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes increase a woman's chance of getting certain cancers, including breast and ovarian, and a man's chance of getting prostate cancer. The discovery of this gene can be an extremely difficult time for those tested and their families and they make plans as they make plans and decisions on how to proceed. Before we get into our speakers this morning, um, I would like to highlight a welcome study in Ireland funded by the Irish Cancer Society, the Unmet Needs in Cancer Genetic Services report, which you may have recently heard um, Professor Josephine Hegarty from UCC in Cork um, as the co-author of this report. Um, so she presented findings which are quite stark. She highlighted that the assessment of an individual's genetic profile plays a critical role across the continuum of cancer care, from screening to the use of targeted therapies, so right across the span. Some of the biggest barriers to genetic testing include cost, fear of the result, waiting times to get genetic tests done for both patient and their families, and concerns around insurance. She highlighted that genetic services are suboptimal in Ireland. Waiting times can be up to two years in the public sector, and it could actually be a further two years for family members to be tested. There's no good reason to have to wait for someone to get sick when it could be prevented. And we all know that early detection saves lives. All our panelists are here today to address some of these findings and to help us to understand the recommendations within the National Cancer Strategy how services are currently running both in the public and the private sector and in the family history clinic and to inform us further of developments in this space. So here is our panel. We're delighted to be joined um, by a diverse team of healthcare experts and Lisa to discuss how we can reach out further and support you. We have Pauline Robinson with us today, Assistant Director of Nursing in the NCCP um, on Cancer Survivorship. Welcome, Pauline. We have Carl Spillan, Breast, um, Breast Family History Clinic, um, a clinical nurse specialist in James's. Owen Hanny, a genetic counsellor in the public health sector. Um, and I would like to congratulate Owen on being a new daddy um, since Sunday of last week. And I know his little baby Jack came home to their family on Wednesday. So thank you for being here with us today, Owen. Um, Jessica Kavanagh, genetic counsellor in the private sector, hermitage mainly and matter. Um, Nikki Warner, who is one of our peer-to-peer -peer volunteer supporters, and um, with that, studying a PhD um, in psychology. So she's a researcher, and she's going to tell us about some of her findings today, and that will be really exciting to hear. Um, and last but not least, we have the lovely Lisa, who I've had the privilege to meet, um, um, and Lisa is going to tell her story of BRCA during the COVID period. So very apt for this morning. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Pauline. Um, Pauline trained as a nurse in Northern Ireland and moved to the UK to train as a midwife and a health visitor. She moved to cancer care when the National Breast uh, Screening Programme started and helped to set up one of the breast, uh, sorry, the one-stop breast clinics and supporting services in 1991. She then worked in breast care until cancer networks were introduced in 2001 moving from a clinical role to a strategic role to help improve the care of cancer patients. Pauline has been with the NCCP since March of last year, um, working on the survivorship programme. But um, Pauline is also a cancer survivor. So Pauline, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate your expertise. Um, and I think, it, you know, um, addressing, I suppose, the unmet needs of BRCA patients in Ireland is a tough call. So over to you, Pauline. 
Thank you, Helen, for the introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And uh, as you can see from uh, the resume, my interest has always been breast cancer. And that actually stemmed from being a young 18-year-old student nurse in Northern Ireland. And it just struck me that there was such a lack of uh, support for breast cancer patients at that time, even down to the fact that the, the client's officer in the hospital was male and he was um, handing out breast prosthesis, electrics, um, elastic stockings, built up shoes, etc. I just could not believe that there was no, no support there. And that stemmed my interest. And as my career developed and I got the opportunity to be part of um, uh, the breast team, I was absolutely delighted. Thank you. Uh, next slide, thanks. And so for today's presentation, I want to just recap on the role of the National Cancer Control Programme and then look at the National Cancer Strategy as it stands today. We do know that there's gaps and challenges which we will acknowledge and we'll talk about some of, some of the developments that are underway. Now going back to the um, National Cancer Strategy of 2000, uh, um, 2006, the uh, National Cancer Control Programme was started in 2007 as a result of the strategy in 2006. And this was the first time that there was actually a concept of cancer control. And this was driven by international research and the knowledge that the UK and Ireland were falling behind statistically on treating cancer and what, what could be done to actually improve that situation. So with the introduction of the National Cancer Control Programme, this included looking at the whole pathway from prevention right through to early detection, diagnosis, treatment, and living with and beyond cancer, which is kind of new terminology, which we're delighted to be able to include in here because uh, we're doing better with treating cancer. So the recommend, recommendations in that strategy that the NCCP would be responsible for reforming and restructuring services. And some of those services, which you'll see on the next slide, was the development of the cancer centres. Now, each cancer centre, cancer centre it serves a population of approximately half a million and you will see the names of the cancer centres um, on the right hand side of the slide. So we've got Beaumont and the Matter Hospital in Dublin North East, St James's and St Vincent's in Dublin Mid Leicester, Leinster and um, in the south we have Cork and Waterford and in the west we have Galway which is satellite in Donegal and Limerick. And with the development of the cancer centres, I remember discussions at that time, people saying, well, why can't we be treated locally? Uh, like it had always happened, you know, where you could go to your local surgeon, Mr. Murphy or Mr. Jones, and he would um, operate on your toenail or your appendix and your breast surgery and your bowel surgery. So the fact that this was recognised that we need specialists who are au fait and specialised only in that particular field, in your particular field, say, um, that patients don't mind travelling and you talk to any patient, they would travel to the ends of the earth to get the proper treatment. So in relation to the cancer centres, the next slide shows the additional hospitals that provide what we call SACT. Now SACT is systemic anti-cancer treatment such as your chemotherapy. So all in all in the country, you'll see from the map there, there are 26 centres actually providing cancer care. And this is all linked up. And we in the, in the National Cancer Control Programme have links in with all of these centres. So moving on to some of the developments that and actions from the National Cancer Control Programme's inception was obviously, again, the centralisation, as I say, of such services as breast services. The induction of rapid access clinics where your GP who sees a patient with a worrying symptom can refer in directly and that patient will be seen in a timely fashion. And all of this just doesn't happen overnight. This is all based on international and national research and evidence-based guidelines that have, have been ratified and signed off to ensure that patients are getting the best cancer treatment. And this relates to the national cancer drug regimens as well, that no matter where you are would you, for your cancer treatment and your cancer drugs, you will get the same um, ev evidence-based uh, uh, regime that's um, suitable for you. A big initiative at the moment is the electronic prescribing, and this is the National Cancer Information System called ENSYS for short. And a lot of the hospitals have 
got this up and running already. And this electronic prescribing system is ensuring safety of prescribing and ensuring a quicker pathway of care for patients uh, having chemotherapy. And it also means that visiting oncologists into the other hospitals will have um, will have access to the same inf patient information on an electronic system. The introduction of electronic referrals from GPs as well has obviously, obviously speeds up the pathway of care and referral into hospitals. There's been major, major investment in prevention and early detection initiatives, including health awareness around lung cancer. And of course, we all know the screening programs, the breast, rectal and cervical screening. And thankfully, there's uh, a lot of uh, survivorship programs being developed at the moment. One that you may be familiar with is the Cancer Drive and Survive program, uh, which is offered to patients who have finished their treatment. And again, uh, health education, healthcare professional education. Uh, one of, uh, for an example, is um, the oncology community training, and this. Uh, is training for community nurses, specifically in issues related to cancer patients, to enable care, more care in the community, to save those patients having to go back to hospital for every, every concern. So a lot has been happening so from, from the 2006 strategy. So this brings us into our present day strategy. And there's four core areas within the strategy. And obviously we're still focusing on prevention. It is known now from the research that up to 40% of cancers are really preventable. And this is usually down to lifestyle changes and screening and, early, uh, uh, and, screening, uh, and early diagnosis. And the development of optimal care and the integrated model of care, which shows that the uh, primary care, secondary care, social care can all be linked to improve the cancer pathway from diagnosis and treatment to ensure safety and quality. And the area that I really love is the next section, which is the patient involvement and quality aspect of the, of the strategy, which is involving patients and care at every aspect um, of the journey. And there is the National Cancer Patient Advisory a group where patients actually are involved in developing any of our projects and we make sure that it's led it's led by patients and the enabling and ensuring change we just don't do this uh, willy-nilly it is uh, governance and uh, backed and the world health organization actually have said that the way to ensure better treatment is to ensure there's a governance in all of these programs and one of the evaluations from the 2006 strategy uh, uh, implementation of the NCCP was that this sort of program is the best way to ensure change for the better for patients. So when we look at the recommendations within the strategy regarding genetics, obviously there are three main ones here, and that is to develop an integrated cancer control and surveillance service, for defined population subgroup with an inherited familial predisposition to cancer, such as breast, ovarian, and colorectal. Further development, the program to further develop the program for hereditary cancers to ensure that evaluation, counselling, testing, and risk reduction interventions are available as appropriate, and that services are available to patients on the basis of need and that the HSE will ensure that existing cancer genetic services are amalgamated into one national cancer genetic service and will identify the most appropriate location for site for that location. Now, bearing in mind, we're 2000, 2017, we're four years now into the strategy. So when we look at the risk assessment and counselling and testing, we have two specialist services. We have the Department of Cancer Genetics at St. James's Hospital and the Department of Clinical Genetics at Children's Hospitals Ireland, Crumlin. There has been some increases made in workforce in the recruitment of some genetic counsellors and agreed testing criteria across both services to ensure that patients are getting the same access. Now, we do know that challenges still remain and some of those challenges and gaps have been identified in the next slide on uh, the 
um, that the funding to, lim to date is very limited. You know, when any strategy is developed, it is certainly the optimum, it is the ideal service you want to provide, but it can't be done cheaply. And, and still we know and we acknowledge that funding is still uh, very limited at this stage. There has been a growth in knowledge in cancer genetics, which is really positive and uh, the word is getting out there. However, the increased knowledge and is increasing demand and increasing pressure on existing services. The overlap with treatment and screening services and the impact of COVID has also been, has had a negative impact on uh, what we can do. And as, as you all know, screening services had been caused to uh, purely for safety measures in relation to COVID and that's a balancing act as to, you, you know, which is the safest uh, route to, to go down. So the screening services were paused, the treatment uh, centres, the numbers of patients being referred in was dramatically reduced. But however, when patients were being seen, um, the process of going through, through the clinic was lengthened greatly to make sure that the safety measures were in place for uh, in relation to COVID. So that resulted in obviously a backlog of mammograms, et cetera, and the screening services have helped out where possible to help uh, uh, undertake some of those mammograms to, to help, help the backlog. But all of the above actually highlights the need for a dedicated PRACA service. Going on to the report that um, Helen has just alluded to, the unmet needs in cancer genetic services, uh, which has highlighted, as Helen said, the waiting times for testing, whether you're the person with cancer or a relative are unacceptably long. There is the need for better coordination of initial assessment and a clearer pathway and a dedicated service to manage those with a cancer predisposition such as, as BRCA. So the, the, we're agreeing with the findings in the report uh, that you know, waiting times are unacceptable at the moment. And in the, uh, the report also highlighted that um, patients reported that when they went to see medical um, practitioners that often they didn't have a lot of knowledge um, around genetics and I just want to say that from this year, the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland have introduced a certificate in cancer genetics, which was only launched in January 21. And this is a six month in-depth um, course for those clinicians who are interested in working and working in genetics. From a more general point of view for your um, HSE employee and your nurses, etc., HSE land, which is the education hub, for healthcare professionals are developing a course on genetic assessment and testing. And this is to skill up patient um, staff that may come across patients going through the genetic testing route. Because as we know, patients going through the genetic testing can be mi are mixed up with your other patients going through a clinic that it isn't a separate service. And when we look at patient information, maybe some of you uh, previously have been involved in earlier discussions around what information patients require regarding genetic services and what's available to them. And this is something that we will be working on in, in the near future. It hasn't moved as quickly as we would have liked. So really what has been achieved when we look back at the genetic service? We have now got, as, as, we, as we know, we have the clinical genetics lead, Dr. David Gallagher appointed at St. James's Hospital, and the second geneticist who's been appointed there, Dr. Karen Cadu. There has been a recruitment campaign and a recruitment of some genetic counsellors and an increase in service and capacity at St. James's Hospital. The care model going forward would be that the St. James's Hospital would be the hub of the genetic service with spokes across the country, ultimately. Some good news is that this year, there has been funding agreed for two posts, for two candidate advanced nurse practitioner posts, 
and the candidate advanced nurse practitioner post are nurses that are uh, extremely well qualified, often to master's degree, who want to take a two year uh, further study to become advanced nurse practitioners. So the, the, the title candidate uh, is there until they actually finish the study and become advanced nurse practitioners. And the advanced nurse practitioner role will be specifically for patients with known mutation. It's nothing to do with cancer, um, with genetic counselling, et cetera, et cetera. It's to look after those patients who have been diagnosed with the genetic bracket problem. And it's the care and management of those patients as their needs change, as we know, as they age. It will be the assessment, education and coordination of their care, which is critical. And treatment plans will need to be adjusted to meet individual requirements as time goes on. The advanced nurse practitioner will have responsibility for their surveillance, in which involves coordination of their imaging and appropriate follow up care to ensure that patients don't fall through the net, uh, which, which we, we know happens if people don't turn up for appointments or screening. We need something in place to ensure that those patients are followed up. And the advanced nurse practitioner will also offer advice on prophylactic surgery. Uh, maybe to the contralateral breast or any ovarian surgery that's required and the appropriate timing and necessary supports before and after such surgery. And a major, major support is the psycholo psychological support element of this role and health and wellbeing advice for that patient going forward. This is a, one area that I'm absolutely so thrilled about is the development of the psycho-oncology service. And thanks to the appointment of a national lead, which is Dr. Helen Greeley based in Galway. And it was following the recognition of a clear need for more service development and resources in this area. And we're delighted to say that the model of care for psycho-oncology was published in the autumn. And it outlines the five models of psycho psychological support available for patients from level one up to level five. And the research has shown that between 10 and 50% of patients will require psychological support at some stage. And out of those, 15% will actually require either clinical psych psychology or psychiatric support for severe, severe trauma and distress. So the model of care is a brilliant docu document because it actually links in the primary care the uh, acute care and the development of multidisciplinary teams and cancer centres. Now, when I talk about this, this isn't our usual multidisciplinary team, uh, clinical team. This is an additional multidisciplinary psycho-oncology te team working in the hospital in conjunction with the clinical team so that any patient coming through the service uh, identified with uh, psychological distress has instant access and referral to the psychology team. So that has been a fantastic development. And uh, the psychology, psych, psychology teams have also close links with the cancer support centres and what they can offer patients. So really, we actually know that there is still considerable work to do. We're only four years into the strategy, but uh, just to reassure you, we're motivated, we're passionate about getting the work done. We're trying to move some of these work streams forward to ensure better, equitable, timely genetics care for the population of Ireland. And we will engage with broader stakeholders to inform this process at any stage. So we're, we, we are there. I know there's a lot to do, but we, we are there to support you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pauline. That was an excellent presentation. And Thank I you. know how difficult that could be, you know, following on from the unmet needs of, um, you know, gen genetic services in Ireland. Um, it's promising, I suppose, that you've talked about and highlighted, you know, the needs themselves um, and that work will be done. So I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you to answer at the end of the session. So in the interest of time, we'll move on. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you. Um, and hello, Carl. Hi. So, Carl, lovely to see you. Carl is a clinical nurse specialist in the breast family risk at St. James's Hospital and has worked as a breast care nurse specialist since 2008. So a wealth of knowledge, Carl. And I know from Pauline's talk there that James, St. James's is probably going to be the hub of, of, 
of uh, the genetic services. So I'll hand over to you now, Carol. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks a million to the Marie Keating Foundation for inviting us to have a chat with you today. I suppose I want to present really what happens once you've been diagnosed with the BRCA alteration and you come to see us. Um, so I suppose just to give you a little background on our service. So it started in 1992 with P um, Professor Peter Daly, who started the Cancer Genetic Services in St. James's. And then on his retirement in 2008, the breast care department um, took over the care of the breast aspect for women who had been diagnosed with a BRCA alteration. Um, in 2010, when the, um, the specialist centres were set up, we took over the care of the patients from Hatala and Port Leash. Um, and that meant that we probably had a cohort of about 450 women who had a BRCA alteration, so quite a large number. So in 2020, after a lot of experience, historically we had consultant led clinics and the, the clinics were led, as I said, by the consultant, but they were manned by the, the medical team. And as we all know, the medical team changes at least once a year. So there wasn't really continuity of care. And so we are just, we're working on a project at the moment. And some of the feedback from that project was, you know, that patients felt that they didn't have continuity of care, that they met different people. They were asked their history the whole time. So based on that information, we decided to change the model of care within St. James's Hospital. So you can move on there, please, Helen. So we decided that the best way forward, uh, I think we need to go back, yeah. Um, the best way forward with regards to our ladies was to set up a nurse-led service. So as Helen alluded, I'm working in St. James's since 2008 and my colleague Yvonne Hanhauser, who is an ANP in breast care and family risk services, we have an awful lot of expertise and that was recognized. So I suppose in terms of our expertise, we had the potential to provide a more accurate picture of cancer risk. We could provide personalized screening for our ladies and we could help them make informed choices in regards to lifestyle modifications that could help improve their or reduce their risk of developing a breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Chemo prevention is probably something that isn't talked about a lot in Ireland, but there are methods by which we could use a drug called tamoxifen to reduce your risk of developing breast cancer. And then obviously, I'm sure all of you who are on this are aware of the risk reducing options in terms of risk reducing mastectomy and oophorectomy. Um, we move on there, please, Helen. So we decided that in conjunction, obviously, with our medical consultants that, you know, as a nurse-led service, we can provide an, an awful lot to our patients. We do have the expertise in terms of breast cancer, so educational, emotional support, psychological support. So in terms of counselling, you know, we wanted to make it very specific to each woman who comes in our door. And the best way to do that is to provide standalone clinics. So our ladies are only attending a family risk service. They're not, they're not in conjunction with the symptomatic services. They only see myself and Yvonne. And in terms of counselling, we want to look at that person's risk. So we all know though that big number, you know, if you have a BRCA1 alteration, you've got a 60 to 90% of developing breast cancer. But we want to look at that risk in terms of how old you are and what, what particular BRCA alteration you do have and where you are particularly in your own life. Um, are you trying to have children? Are you postmenopausal? All of those things need to be considered when working out your, your cancer risk. So the nurse side clinic with myself and Yvonne allow time for that to sit down with each individual patient and work out your risk. Obviously, as I said, we have an awful lot of experience working with women with breast cancer. So emotional support is very important in terms of that. You know, you see the same person at a clinic, you develop continuity of care and you can develop a rapport with that woman, which means that she's more likely to feel comfortable opening up to you about some of the issues that she may be having. For example, post um, oophorectomy, the menopausal side effects, you know, are very rapid on, on, in onset and probably very poorly managed. So with a nurse led service, we are able to provide a support in managing those side effects. You know, we have the expertise, so we are able to perform clinical exam or physical exams so taking a history and examining a breast. And we can advise on the risk reducing strategies that are available. So as I already said, the risk reducing mastectomies and the options that go with that in terms of reconstru reconstruction, because every woman is different, every body shape is different. And the type of reconstruction that might be applicable to you, you know, we can give you the information on that. And then obviously, when is it appropriate to do that? And in terms of your oophorectomy, again, when is it appropriate to do that? 
And we have the ability then to refer you on to whatever services are required in terms of helping you with that risk reducing surgery. So in terms of your mastectomy, the breast surgeon and the plastic surgeon, and in terms of oophorectomy, we have a very good relationship with our gynae colleagues so we can refer you on to discuss those options when they're appropriate to your lifestyle. And I suppose probably more importantly, we can spend time teaching you with regards to the modifications in your lifestyle that you can make to help reduce your risk and also how to perform a proper breast exam what to be looking out for when to do it um, and that's you know as, as a nurse-led service seeing the same people we have the time to do that you can move on please helen at our clinic what would happen is you know you come we sit down, we, we don't really, I suppose, you know, you have been diagnosed with a BRCA alteration, so nobody wants to rehash the information that they've already previously given. So the only question we ask with regards to that, is there a change in your family history? Then we sit down and make sure that you don't have any concerns. So do you have any lumps, bumps, any discharges, anything that you're worried about? And then we'll do a physical exam. And you know, the, the physical exam takes a little bit of time. It's done sitting up and lying down so that we can make sure that we recognize any changes that might be done. And we were doing that on, on an annual or biannual, so twice a year, so six monthly. The literature just suggests that there's absolutely no rationale for doing that. So we have changed our system probably because of COVID to just see our, see our ladies once a year in our clinic, unless of course they have any concerns and they know then they have a contact number, they can contact us and we can see them outside the normal clinic time. Again, an advantage of a nurse-led clinic because we are in the service the whole time. And um, so our ladies have direct access to us should they ever need us. Then six monthly, so instead of the six monthly clinical consult, we would do a telephone consultation just to make sure, you know, you're not at home worrying about something. It might not be breast related. It could be something to do with the fact you've had an oophorectomy. You're having horrendous side effects from that. You don't know really who to speak to. So you have access to us in terms of that. So our six monthly consultation will just make sure that there isn't something that we do need to be seeing you um, in the clinic about. From a screening perspective, you know, as uh, with the BRCA alteration, it's very important that you do have access to mammography and to MRI screening. And, you know, as we mentioned already, the service in St. James's is very well established. So we have both of those modalities and including access, should you need it, to ultrasound, to core biopsy, to MRI biopsy. So all of those services are available within, the, within St. James's Hospital. I'm sure most of you are aware that in, return, in regards to your imaging, so your mammography is introduced from 40 until whenever. Um, and MRI, the international guidelines would recommend MRI from 30. But as we all know, women are testing a little bit earlier than previously. Um, so if there is a family history of a young onset of cancer under the age of 30, we have an agreement with our radiology department that we can, st we can provide MRI surveillance from 25. Um, once we've you know, we've established all of that. We've made sure your screening's up to date. There's nothing that we're concerned about. The clinical exam is fine. We will, uh, um, I suppose, allude to um, the risk reducing options. Not everybody is interested in, in those options. It depends when, where they are in their time of life. And we do take that into consideration. So it's not something that you have to do. It's just something that you know is available to you should you wish to discuss it. Um, and in the event that somebody would like to discuss those options, myself and Yvonne spend quite a bit of time going through the different options in terms of what is your body shape, what are your um, expectations, what options would you like to, um, to look into. And based on that, with our ladies, we make a choice as to which breast surgeon, or sorry, well, not which breast surgeon, but which plastic surgeon is most appropriate for that woman to see in terms of giving her the best outcomes in terms of her risk reducing um, options. Where possible, you know, you don't want to provide a situation where a woman has to, is looking at risk reducing options and has no option for breast reconstruction. And um, so no. wherever possible, we will um, make sure that happens. And in some cases, you know, women do not want to um, look at the risk reducing options. So we're doing both. So we know they know it's there. The option is there. Um, but we continue with our screening. So most importantly, I think the change that we've made is that because it's a nurse led service and we are in St. James on site all of the time, our patients have much more access to us than they would have had previously to a medical team. You can move on, please, Helen. Um, as I mentioned, the risk reducing options for some people, these are really, really important from the onset of their BRCA alteration diagnosis. And it's really to make the patients aware of what is out there. 
So in terms of the risk reducing mastectomy, we know um, that it reduces your risk by 95% of developing a breast cancer. We can't give you 100% risk reduction. Unfortunately, the survival benefit is not yet established. So we don't know, um, will it make a massive difference to, the, to our women in terms of developing a breast cancer later on? In, um, to their life, to the life expectancy is what I mean by that. In terms of the bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, well, firstly, it's very important in terms of reducing your breast cancer risk. So it can reduce your breast cancer risk by 50%, which is incredibly significant. And that is if it's performed before 40 years of age. It also gives you an 80% reduction in terms of ovarian and peritoneal mal malignancies. And we know from the literature that the the screening options in terms of transvaginal ultrasound and the CA125 blood test, they're not particularly sensitive, particularly in young women. Um, so I suppose at our clinics, although we are breast related, we do spend quite a lot of time talking to our younger patients when they're ready to about the, the benefit of the oophorectomy um, prior to a risk reducing mastectomy. And there is a very well established survival benefit from having your oophorectomy before the age of 40. Thank you, Helen. The risk reducing pathway, we have introduced this because, you know, both surgeries have a massive impact um, on you as a woman, on your body image, on how you feel. In terms of the oophorectomy, you go into overnight menopause. And in terms of the mastectomy, it changes the, your, the I suppose, your body image massively. So, while they are very important and people wish to explore their options, it is important that we as the nursing team um, at St. James's Hospital prepare you for what's going to come from, from those changes. So we've established a pathway that once entering it, our, our, our aim is that if the patient will have completed their surgery, particularly we're talking more about the breast surgery within a year. Um, and that obviously is as our history, our family history clinic, so that we've discussed all those options with you. We will um, send you to a psych oncologist who works in St. James's Hospital. Um, her name is Amri O'Dwyer, so that she can discuss through all of the issues you have regarding these surgeries, such so that she feels that, I suppose, psychologically and mentally, you're prepared for what change is to come. We do have a dedicated family history and um, multidisciplinary team meeting at St. James's Hospital, where we discuss um, patients who wish to proceed with risk reducing surgery, but also patients who are on surveillance and um, any issues that we come across. And then we have a dedicated plastic and reconstructive breast surgeon, so we refer you to those. So between commencing that program and completing it, it generally takes about, about a year, hopefully. Um, and I suppose with the last slide, you know, we have made massive inroads and the, the feedback we've had from our women has been incredibly positive, um, but we have the same issues as any other clinic um, within the health services, and that is funding. So we fund our clinic through our symptomatic service, and because our clinic is, is increasing in size all of the time, we need to find a way to prevent this and, and fund the clinic completely separately to our symptomatic services. Yvonne and I um, are very, very passionate about developing standardized assessment clinics nationally. So I'm only speaking about what we do in St. James's Hospital today. I'm not speaking for the rest of the country, but uh, we feel that our model of care has improved the care of our BRCA ladies. And we feel that you know, standardized clinics around the country will make a massive difference. We'd also like to, um, I suppose, um, work with the NCCP to develop national guidelines so that everybody's working off the same hymn sheet. So there's equity of care, both within um, clinics, so standalone clinics, so, are, so ladies don't feel that they're taking up the time of a symptomatic unit. They're, they're just as important as a woman who comes to a clinic with breast pain, if not more important to us. And also what's most important, I think, in terms of the risk reducing options is that women are have, there's equity of access. So it doesn't matter what center you, you are sent to, you have all the different options available to you in terms of reconstruction, <clears throat> because they are incredibly important to ensuring that you have a good outcome from your experience within our clinics. Thank you very much. I probably flew through that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carol, we're on time. Yeah, I was, I was conscious of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that was a lovely overview of, of the services that you and Yvonne provide in St. James's. And what comes across um, to me, I think, is the holistic approach to care, which is, which is what's really required. 
and the whole MDT, you know, the, the participation within the multidisciplinary team process. So high quality delivery um, and supportive service. So thank you, Carl, for that. Again, we'll wait till the end of the morning sure. session for questions. So thanks so much. Um, we were about to take a little break. I think we've got a minute if people just want to take a breath um, before before we, we bring Owen on. So we'll just take a minute and I'll, I'll call Owen on in, in, in that space of time. Um, for anybody who would like, um, I suppose, information on the Marie Keating services, you can you can find all the links online here, um, information on our website, our Bracket Peer to Peer Support Network and online support group um, managed by Bernie Carter, our um, Assistant Director of Nursing. Um, last year's BRCA webinar where, again, you know, there's a huge amount of information there and available. Um, our events page, <clears throat> which looks at um, seminars such as this um, and positive living and survive and thrive programs, um, which are extremely important in terms of surviving after cancer. Um, and we have a virtual hub as well, which, which um, has a series of webinars from last year, mainly around cancer and COVID, but also looking at um, how carers cope, um, you know, when someone in their family is diagnosed with cancer. And as I said, our surviveandthrive.ie website is actually really important and being developed over time. And it's actually important for people who maybe do not want, you know, to be part of um, a face-to-face -face or an online um, supportive service. So there's lots of information there from a psychological perspective, the physical effects of treatments um, and practical signposting as well. Okay. So um, I'd like to bring Owen in now, if that's okay. Yeah, no problem. You're in Owen, thank you very yeah. much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, so Owen, let me just introduce you first. So Owen is a European Board of Medical Genetics registered genetic counselor. Um, he worked in the NHS in Scotland for five years before moving home to Ireland. He also worked as genetic, uh, sorry, cancer genetic cancer in Black Rock Clinic um, for two years, and that's where we met Owen first when he came back to Ireland. Uh, he was delighted to take up a full time role as the clinical genetics department in Crumlin in January of this year. So very new to that service, Owen. Um, and your area of interest is hereditary cancer predisposition syndromes. So Owen, you're very welcome, and thank you for being with us this morning. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, please. Sure. Um, my slides, uh, Helen, have a lot of kind of, you know, ones that just shoot across. So if you want to just go put them all down in one, that's, yeah, absolutely fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I um, see what you mean. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, what I'm going to do today, I, I suppose it's probably a mixed audience. I think, Helen, you were saying that we might be talking to this. Probably um, a lot of people in the audience who have been through genetic counselling themselves, but there might be some members of the audience who haven't actually been through the service yet. And so just to lay out a little bit about what genetic counselling is and what people should expect uh, when they are referred to, to see a genetic counsellor. Um, I'll also then um, talk a little bit about the current services at CHI and Crumlin and how things are running. I'll touch on a couple of things that I think came up on the, the Q&A already um, around issues like insurance as well, because I think that's something that quite commonly comes up and people have questions about. And then at the end, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we've moved to um, telemedicine and telegenetics for our appointments, just to give a little bit of feedback about the pros and cons of that and encourage any feedback from, from uh, participants uh, about all of that as well. So if you'd like to go to the next slide, Helen. So um, what is genetic counselling? Um, this is a question I get asked quite a lot. Um, particularly when people ask you what you do, you say, I'm a genetic counsellor. Well, what is that? Um, I suppose I'll try to give a, a brief outline of that. So if I go to the next slide, Helen. Um, the, the definition of genetic counselling is that it is a communication process which aims to help individuals, couples and families understand and adapt the medical, psychological, familial and reproductive implications of the genetic con contribution to specific health conditions. So that's quite a, a wordy um, definition. But I like the kind of little diagram down below 
um, which kind of discusses the different aspects to our, our role. So part of the role of a genetic counselor is to interpret somebody's family history to assess the risk of there being a, 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 an increased risk of developing a certain condition. I suppose today it's around, well, interpreting someone's family history to see what is the, the, the chance of there being a hereditary predisposition to breast cancer or ovarian cancer? What is the risk of there being a faulty BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene in a family? And who's the best person that we should be testing in a family to try to identify that? So that's a big part of our role is taking a family history, interpreting that family history and making risk assessments on the basis of that. The second part of our role then that's really important is around education. So particularly around the topic of genetics, it's something that a lot of people wouldn't have much of a background in. So a lot of our job would be um, explaining what is the risk um, of having a, a fault in either BRCA1 or BRCA2? What, what are the options around um, uh, for, for managing the risks associated with that? Um, and it's not just, I suppose, kind of education with facts and figures. It's also kind of uh, in kind of educating people about how they may feel about the idea of having a genetic test. And I suppose that's where the idea of the counselling bit comes in. We're, we're not therapeutic counsellors, but we all have specific counselling skills training. And we know that um, having a genetic test or deciding to, either deciding to have what we call a diagnostic genetic test to see, can we identify if there is a faulty gene causing a problem in the family, or what we call a predictive test, which is having a test to see have you inherited the faulty gene that your mother may have had, that your sister may have had, um, that there's a whole lot of psychological issues that, that can be uh, brought up for a person, both for themselves and for their family. And I suppose we can, um, we can provide support around those issues and provide, I suppose, an environment where we can get uh, patients to talk about their own experiences, um, ask the questions that they need answer, and we can fill in the gaps for them. And I suppose what we try to do is support them through the process, process of genetic testing because it can be quite a difficult time for anybody. Um, but it was a big part of our work then is trying to, to signpost people to appropriate support after they've kind of come through our service and been through the genetic testing process. So if you'd like to go to the next slide, Alan. So again, if you want to drop them down to the end. So I suppose just to, to go back over, oh, is he okay? Um, just to go back over things a little bit. Um, we are not therapeutic counselors but we have master's level training in molecular and clinical genetics. We have expertise working with families with hereditary cancer syndromes, and we, we are experts in the impact that a genetic test can have on both the patient and their families. And we have formal training and counseling skills and interventions. And so we can help individuals discuss their lived experiences of cancer and BRCA, and we can focus on their specific concerns and worries. We encourage patients to prepare for the possible outcomes of genetic testing, I suppose the idea there is that the more prepared you are, the better you might adapt to the result that does come. Um, and then, as I said, we kind of sign what, signpost and onward refer to different services, whether that's for screening and surgery or to clinics like Carol's, where, where you would have your screening and surgery discussed or to support services um, like, like the Marie Keating Foundation. And again, I suppose we're experts in our field and we keep up to date with the latest, latest guide, guidelines and research, I suppose, we hope to share that information with other medical professionals. Next slide, please, Alan. Um, a couple of questions that came up in the chat uh, in the Q&A I noticed earlier on were about insurance uh, implications of genetic testing. And I just make, want to make it very clear that the Disabilities Act 2005 uh, basically protects people who have had a genetic test. You do not have to disclose the results of a genetic test um, to, to any insurer um, whether that's um, life insurance, uh, health insurance, mortgage protection, anything like that, okay? You may have to disclose your family history of cancer. They can ask you questions about um, who in the family has had certain types of cancer, and you'd have to discuss that. But they cannot ask you about the results of the genetic test. And if for some reason that does come up, they cannot, or, you know, that, that is disclosed, they cannot use that when they are, you know, uh, getting your, uh, assessing your premium or your, your ability to get um, uh, insurance. And I suppose the way I would look at it is from the insurance company's point of view, um, you know, it's better for someone to know that they have a genetic predisposition to cancer and then that person is getting the appropriate screening or risk reducing surgery to reduce the risk of developing cancer. I suppose just to give, a, you know, to be really clear about it, 
um, the insurers cannot ask about the results of a genetic test. And it, it is something um, Helen mentioned that the Irish Cancer Support study kind of flagged that insurance uh, worries are one of the barriers or things that stop people coming forward for testing. And I think that's what I found myself uh, in the UK. It didn't seem to be a problem at all. But in Ireland, I hear much more kind of uh, through the grapevine that um, people are being asked about things like this or, or worried about things like this. And that's what prevents them from coming forward. Um, if anybody wants some, some more specific questions, um, this website down here, insuranceireland.eu, they have a little search bar. And if you put in genetics, there's a report in there that kind of breaks things down a little bit more for people. Um, you can move on to the next slide, Helen. Um, just a very brief overview of the clinical genetic services at CHI in Crumlin. Um, we're now nine genetic counselors. So I started in January and we took on another full-time genetic counselor in March. Um, so that's about 7.5 uh, whole time equivalents. Um, so we are getting more people in the door, more bodies in the door. Um, we've currently got, um, I suppose I should say that not all of those nine genetic counselors would be working specifically on cancer genetics. And uh, we would all do a mix of cancer genetics and general stuff and prenatal genetics as well. And um, we've got four consultant clinical geneticists. And again, their workload will be spread across different specialities. Currently, I know this is a big issue for a lot of, of patients. And you know, when, when we kind of had our, our pre-meeting chat, it was one of the topics that came up is around the waiting list. At the moment, our current waiting list for a predictive test. So when we know there's a faulty BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene in the family and we know what the, the fault is, we're offering testing to other members of the family. The waiting time for a test like that is roughly around 12 months. If that has come down significantly in the last six months, but obviously it's still unacceptably high as it as you know, we, we, we're all can, can accept. Um, we can accommodate urgent referrals um, for urgent genetic testing for patients who um, or have been diagnosed with cancer and the result of the, of the genetic test may Im, uh, impact their, their clinical management, whether it might change the type of chemotherapy they're having or it might change their risk, their, their, risk, their, their surgery options. Um, we, we can accommodate urgent referrals for, for that. Next slide, please, Helen. So again, just to touch on a couple of the things that came up in the, the, the report that Helen mentioned earlier on, um, the, the unmet, me, uh, un, unmet needs in, in cancer genetic services. So some of the really big take home um, messages in there were that the cancer genetic services in Ireland have been chronically underfunded and under-resourced. Um, you know, we are, I know it's very frustrating that people are sat on waiting lists and, and um, you know, and their family members are then sat on waiting lists and um, we, I suppose, are working as hard as we can. Um, I suppose a point I wanted to make was that I used to work in Scotland, and Scotland has the similar, a similar population to Ireland. I think they maybe got um, a, maybe a couple of hundred thousand more than, than we have. But in Ireland, we have about 11 full-time genetic counsellors, whereas in Scotland, there's 33. You know, that's from a similar population. And across the board, um, it's you know it's, it's known that Ireland per capita has one of the the lowest um, per capita genetic counselling services and, and clinical genetics um, per, per capita as well. Um, so I suppose that's something that you know we can do more if there are more of us. Um, something that was was kind of talked about in the report, and I think something that would be really important going forward is this idea of mainstreaming or streamlining the diagnostic cancer to, uh, testing pathway. So that would be where um, maybe um, patients are, are are tested by their um, by their oncologist or their surgeon um, at the point of them having a diagnosis, and in that way the testing is turned around quicker, and those people aren't sat on waiting lists. I suppose with that we would worry that yeah, the people organising those tests can ad adequately counsel or educate patients about the implications of the test, and we'd also worry that you know would we then see all these families where, where a faulty gene has been found or would it just be seen as a test that was done as part of somebody's um you know um cancer cancer treatment and and it kind of gets lost there but that would be a big idea and we, we would all for working towards an, an area like that where specialists in, in in oncology are ordering these tests and then we can then see the family members and talk them through the results uh, and do further testing for, for wider family members um, another thing that the report flagged up, which is really uh, important, something that kind of goes back to what Carol was talking about, is that, you know, even if there was 100 genetic cancers and we were, you know, turning around, you know, the waiting list didn't exist and we were seeing people and, and 
and kind of getting all these results well what happens with all those patients afterwards you know we, we don't need to, need to just fund the, the testing part. We need to fund the, the post-testing part, you know, that people are getting adequate screening, adequate surgery, um, you know, and that, that the waiting list for that side of things and support about all of that is also there. So we have places for these people to go. So I think we need to look at the big picture for all of this. Um, so they're putting together an action plan. I think that's really encouraging. And, you know, we would love to be part of anything that we can do to help to, to move things forward, I suppose. We, we need to look at, um, so we need investment as everywhere does. We need to look at new models of delivering care and hopefully that's something that we can work towards as well. Next slide, please, Alan. So I suppose I just wanted to give a little bit of information about how things are working uh, at the, in the genetics part, department in Crumlin with COVID-19. So prior to COVID-19, the vast, vast majority of genetic appointments were face-to-face -face, and you would get referred either by your GP if there was a family history of, of cancer that you're worried about, or if a faulty gene had been identified by uh, in the family, or you may be referred in by your oncologist if you had a diagnosis of cancer. Um, during lockdown then, um, with, with travel restrictions and everything that happened, we shifted to telephone appointments. So uh, patients are sent out a dedicated time in the post. We would phone them at that time, um, have a, a telephone con consultation um, for about 45 minutes. Um, and if the, uh, the patient decides to, to proceed with testing at that point, we would either ask them to come in, if they live locally, we'd ask them to come to the hospital in, in Crumlin to, uh, to give a blood sample. Um, or if they live further away, they could either arrange to get bloods taken through their GP and sent up to us um, or, or through the local hospital. But it's, I suppose it's important to say that GPs can't, um, can't arrange genetic testing for BRCA or BRCA1 you know, BRCA or BRCA2 testing unless, you know, that the person has had adequate genetic counseling. So we're doing the genetic counseling, we're sending posts in the form and pretty much the GP or the practice nurse is just taking the blood sample that we need for the test and sending it into us. So next slide, please, Helen. And um, if you wanna drop all of these down, I suppose just to show that there is a precedent for, for using telemedicine and telegenetics. And um, so back in 2016, they, there was a pub, uh, paper published. And I think this actually was the, the research was carried out about maybe 2013, 14, and it sent questionnaires to 104 genetic professionals across Europe. And only about 17% of those were using telephone genetic counseling at that time. And only about 9% were using video calls with patients. Um, most of the studies that have been published since then have kind of shown that patients' experience of telegenetics is quite positive overall. Um, on the other side of it, um, professionals are more kind of um, moderately positive towards it in that we have some reservations. And I think I had some reservations before the idea of kind of telephone or, or um, kind of Zoom appointments in that um, I always felt that, you know, um, person to person or face to face genetic counseling would be gold standard because you're sitting with the person and you can develop a better relationship or connection with that person. Having said that, I was very surprised about how, um, how well certain phone appointments can, can work. And particularly during COVID, I found that there was a kind of certain um, cohort of people who actually really enjoyed having a phone call and you know taking the time to go through things and actually um i think for some people a phone call can be better than a face-to-face -face appointment but it has its pros and cons which i will work through in a second i suppose the pandemic has pushed all of this forward um, and all areas of medicine are now looking at kind of telemedicine opportunities i think it's a there's big opportunities for genetics in that in the future and um, so if you want to go to the next slide please helen and so again um Another piece of research that was published this year, and again from um, uh, as someone known very well to, uh, to this parish, uh, Dr. Terry McVeigh, um, who I think talked that last year and the year before's BRCA webinar. Um, Terry and her colleagues in um, London did a, a really nice piece of research that compared telephone genetic counselling for BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing versus in-person genetic counselling. Um, I suppose the main takeaways for, for, from their piece uh, of research was that the, the really important thing about for, for genetic testing is, is this idea of informed consent and the patient understands um, fully the implications of the test and the implications that the test might have for them and their family going forward. And we know through research that um, if a person has a high level of cancer distress or if they have uh, low levels of genetic knowledge, these are really the, the two things that can kind of impair informed consent and that can Im impair, I suppose, um, how well a genetic counselling consultation goes. So um, 
addressing patients' concerns and distress, improved comprehension of genetic information. So I suppose that's what we focus on in appointments is, well, what are your concerns about this? What is What makes you most distressed about all of this? And where are your knowledge gaps that we can help you fill in? And I suppose just the take home message is that from their research, they found that telephone genetic counseling is what they call non-inferior. So they're saying there's no significant difference or it's not that the patients don't report um, uh, feeling worse about or, or less kind of informed or more stressed about having a telephone appointment rather than um, an in-person appointment. But I suppose the take home again is that we, this area needs, needs a bit of further study. Next slide, please, Helen. I suppose to, to kind of go through the our, our own experiences in house, I kind of emailed all the genetic counselors and asked for a bit of feedback about what they found um, was was beneficial and um, what we thought was beneficial for patients. And I suppose um, what we found is that for the patients, um, telephone appointments or, or video call appointments um, can be really helpful because they're convenient. You don't have to travel. You don't have to take as much time off work. You maybe don't have to um, uh, organize a whole day of childcare. The idea of travel, I find, is really important. Since I moved to, to Crumlin, the vast majority of my patients seem to be either from uh, West Cork and Kerry or, or from Donegal. And, you know, the idea that someone would have to travel five, six hours to come for a, a genetic counselling appointment and then go, you know, it's, some people might need to have to stay overnight and things like that. So the idea that we could do this over the phone and save the travel up, I think, um, is very beneficial. I think it's probably something that will, will be a driver for this kind of thing staying in the future is that, you know, you know, with the virtual appointments save all of that. Um, what we've also found then it's it's quite quite good for high risk patients, so such as you know uh, women who have uh, around breast cancer treatment or ovarian cancer treatment. Um, they don't have to have another hospital appointment. They don't have to put themselves at risk by coming for another appointment. We can do it all over the phone. We can send them the bloods. They can get the bloods taken at their next chemo appointment or whatever it is. Um, I suppose during COVID then. The idea of you know older uh, populations who are either cocooning or people who um, maybe had sick children or had a high risk for COVID, you know, it was much better for them actually not to have to come in in person than just to have to be able to do the appointment from home and get their bloods taken locally. Um, we find that some patients are much more relaxed. They're in their own homes, maybe sat at their own kitchen table with a cup of tea. Um, you know, I know myself that I maybe get a little bit stressed if I'm going to hospital for something. Um, whereas actually, if you're sat at home, um, you, you might be a little bit less stressed about that. It doesn't feel as medical as, as I put there. Um, what we found, I suppose, is that less people miss appointments as well, you know, because I suppose even if they forgot about the appointment, when you ring them, they'll either generally um, make time for you at that point or say, look, now is not a great time. Uh, can you call me back later on today? And if we have capacity to do that, it means that, you know, because I'm at my desk, I can say, yeah, no worries. Like, I, I can call you back this afternoon when I was going to do some, you know, paperwork. Well, actually, I can do my paperwork now. I can call you then. So the, the increased flexibility is really um, is really good for both us and patients, I think. And then there was an idea that one of my colleagues said to us that she feels that there's a higher uptake in, in genetic testing in some families for some conditions and that some families might be less, um, less, less likely to travel or less likely to have the testing done. Um, now, again, you know, that, that's just purely um, kind of um, her, her own opinion. So if you'd like to go to the next slide, please, Helen. And again, so I suppose the drawbacks are a little bit longer, um, I suppose, and just kind of reflect some of the things that we've had. I suppose technical problems such as kind of, you know, phone calls dropping or reception being very bad, or even just the logistics of um, uh, taking blood samples. Uh, you know, some GPs um, might not really be, be keen on it and again you know gps are swamped at the moment so i know it's a lot for us to be asking them to take blood samples from our patients and um, but I suppose it's just added a little layer of things that the logistics um we sometimes get and i, I know it's, it's a bit unusual maybe just to hear but that patients don't fully engage um in a telephone appointment because they're they're doing something else at the same time you know we've had people taking calls whilst they're driving whilst they're out on the farm whilst they have kids in the background even whilst they're at their work desk um, and I suppose it's a bit disconcerting from our point because, again, we're kind of saying, well, does a person have a full understanding of all of the issues if they're not fully engaged into, in the consultation? Now, it could be that that person does have a full understanding and knows exactly how they feel about everything, um, but it's harder for us to gauge that when it's over the phone. Um, I suppose another thing that I had, again, it kind of comes up again, and, and the, next, the next bit is that 
it's harder to get a, a, true, a true sense of someone's emotions um, over the phone. Now, again, sometimes it works very, very well, but I know, you know, I had a phone consultation recently with a young girl who was contemplating bracket testing and she became very upset over the phone. And again, without being actually being in the room with her, being able to see her even, it was hard to pick up on her body language, on her verbal cues, on her non-verbal cues to see, well, what is it exactly that was upsetting her? So I found that one very tricky. To be honest, you know, probably 90% of the tele, tele uh, calls I've done so far have been absolutely, you know, you know, absolutely fine. But there's probably maybe 10% where these types of issues kind of kind of crop in. Um, I do think that it, it might be slightly harder to build up a rapport or a relationship with people over the phone. Now, again, some people are absolutely fine with it. Um, but I think sometimes the younger generation possibly aren't as used to um, maybe taking phone calls. Um, and therefore it's a little bit more difficult for them and um, then I suppose the other issue is we've got lack of visual aids you know sometimes people are different people learn in different types of ways and you know if, if you go to a genetic counseling appointment sometimes the genetic counselor might show you different diagrams just to explain what they're talking about and again over the phone we can't do that and um, something else we found is that we, we would often see siblings together if they wanted to be seen together and that gets a bit more tricky or even couples you know, where, where you're, you're on speakerphone and the reception isn't great and you're kind of, people can't maybe ask questions or you can't read the room, you know, while someone's talking, you can't be looking at the other person to see how they're reacting to that, you know. So again, that makes it a bit tricky. Um, and then it's not suitable for everybody because there's people out there, you know, with learning difficulties, with hearing problems or different issues where face-to-face -face would just be much better. Um, but I think, you know, I think our learning from it is that for the vast majority of patients, it, it does work and it works well. Um, but I think definitely issues around the kind of the non-engagement would be a little bit of a worry for us in that, you know, that, that they're distracted by something else. You know, um, you know, it's a very important conversation. It's very important to, to be engaged in. Okay, next slide, please, Alan. Okay, so just, um, this might be my last or second last slide. So I suppose, um, my own opinion is that I still think that pers uh, in person or face to face genetic counseling is still gold standard of care. And I think both for the patients and for the genetic counselors, you know, most genetic counselors get into this type of a job because we like we like meeting people, we like connecting with people on that level, and we like supporting and helping people through a process like this. And so I think to to have that face to face, and even it's over even over video, it might be working a little bit better. I know Jessica, who's speaking after me, might have a bit more of an insight on the video call side of things. Something she's been doing a little bit of. We would hope that we are moving there. Um, so it's just to kind of recap. You know, we know that telegenetics is effective and it is acceptable to both patients and clinicians. If anybody has experience of it, I'd love if you maybe popped it into the questions and answers, or just gave us feedback here, because obviously we'd like to develop our service so that we can kind of have it, um, you know, what, you know, what's best for the patient. So I think having the option of a telephone appointment, even when we're post COVID, I think will, will be a great thing to have. Um, and I think we will be moving towards an, uh, an area where we can do video and webcam based appointments, where again, you know, it will be face to face in a sense, so you can see people's uh, reactions and things like that, and might be able to use um, uh, visual aids and things like that. Um, one thing, I suppose that's that's all I was going to cover. Um, there was one thing I was going to pick up on if I have time, Helen, if that's okay. It was just about um something Carol mentioned in the previous um her, her chat. And again, we we can talk about it in the question and answers if it's more appropriate appropriate, but it would just be about I saw there was questions in QA as well, it would be around the the breast cancer risk reduction by having a, a risk reducing ovarian, um, so having your, your ovaries removed and the benefits that that has for reducing your breast cancer risk and mm. um, I suppose more recently in the last few years there's been more question marks raised about whether having your ovaries removed actually does significantly reduce your breast cancer risk for BRCA women particularly with BRCA1 um, but I suppose just again it's, it's relatively new but I suppose that we wouldn't talk as much about that because there's question marks about that whole that whole that whole thing so I suppose just to flag it up and we can talk about it more in the questions and answers if we need to. thanks on yeah I think we'll bring it up at the the Q&A session um but not good to raise it um <clears throat> thanks on so much for your presentation um it was really nice to look at you know to to hear your experience from the teleconferencing and or telephoning sorry and um and and uh, I suppose 
the negative sides of it because we're not always hearing that at the moment. And I, you know, in the belief that you're a genetic cancer, you like to meet people, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. Thanks, Owen, very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call on um, Jessica now. Um, so, Jessica. So, are you there, Jessica? I am, I'm here, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Jessica, how are you? Hi, good, thanks. So Jessica is a HCPC registered genetic counselor working in the cancer genetic services at the Hermitage Medical Clinic. Jessica comp completed the master's in genomic counseling at Manchester University um, <clears throat> while working as a trainee genetic counselor in the NHS at Cambridge University Hospital for three years. Prior to this training program, Jessica obtained a BSc in biology from UCD, worked in, in clinical and research laboratories and completed a certificate course in counseling and psychotherapeutic skills. So Jessica, we've listened to Owen from the public sector and now it'd be lovely to, to hear from yourself working in the private sector around genetic services. Thank you, Jessica, over to you. Thanks, Helen. Um, and I, I am conscious of time, so I'll try to keep this under the 10 yeah. minutes. Mm -hmm. So just the next slide there, please. My video's on, isn't it? I can't see myself. I'm sure it's working fine. Um, so I'm going to talk about genetic counselling, so what we do. So I'm going to be repeating it a little bit, um, and but more so from a private sector, I'm going to talk about my experience um, working within the private sector here in Ireland. I'm going to go through the patient pathway and also my experience with the virtual testing. Um, so the remote testing that we've started um, a couple of months ago with COVID. And then I'm going to talk about and focus a bit on the support and our roles as genetic counsellors and kind of post-test and what we can offer and what we can't offer as well. Next slide. So I thought this was a nice description of genetic counselling. So what is genetic counselling? So a it's a therapeutic encounter that enables sense-making of genetic information. So I think that captures the essence of what we aim to do as genetic counsellors. So, you know, we're, we try to focus on person-centred care or person-focused care. We try to make the consultation a therapeutic you know, event and we try to be led by the, by the individual in front of us and obviously try to make the genetic information um, as easy to understand as much as we can. And um, we know it can be a lot of information to take in, especially at a pre-test predictive genetic um, appointment. And um, so our aim is to, you know, to, to be led by the patient, which Owen touched on as well. We assess personally, personal and family history um, of cancers and we offer and discuss genetic testing, possible results, limitations of testing as well, which is more um, relevant for diagnostic appointments and obviously the implications if someone is found to have a, a gene alteration. We then talk about the plan for results and try to provide support as much as possible and always follow up with written information um, about the, the estimation of risk and, and we include advice about um, what to do about that. Next slide. So we are healthcare professionals, usually from a scientific nursing or social care background with a master's degree in genetic or genomic counselling, which we obtained from outside of Ireland and are registered with a professional body. So there's three currently, the Association of Genetic Nurses and Counsellors, the European Society of Human Genetics and the Health and Care and Professions Council. Next slide. So I'm working in the private sector since 2019, following my training. And I'm based in the Hermitage Medical Clinic. We, so the private clinics have been in operation since 2010 and they're currently run um, in, within three hospitals, unfortunately all in Dublin and hopefully that will change in the future. The services are led by Professor David Gallagher who's an oncologist cancer geneticist and also the lead in St. James's Hospital Cancer Genetic Service as well. And in the last couple of years health insurance companies have come on board and covered you know, part or, or all of the course of the genetic test, which we know can be quite significant part of consult fee. Next slide. So since 2010, referrals have increased year on year. Um, so I did an audit in 2019, where over 900 patients were seen within the three services, and that compares to the year before, where only 300 were seen, um, and then, you know, half that in 2015. So the service growth is due to a number of factors. So in 2019, we did have four, you know, full-time genetic counselors slash nurses, um, and we had, you know, more clinics to be seen, to be able to see patients or individuals. The referrals 
the number of referrals have increased quite a lot and then health insurance companies kind of since 2018 have come on board which has caused um you know a, a growth in the service as well next slide so in terms of, a, of the wait lists, um, so the, a routine appointment um, for the diagnostic or predictive test, currently about two to four months, this can vary. Um, you know, it was higher during obviously COVID when we, when we did shut down clinics. The turnaround time for testing, um, same as kind of everywhere, four to 16 weeks. Four weeks is for predictive testing. So um, they're a lot quicker. We know where in the gene we're looking for. There are a lot more straightforward tests as opposed to diagnostic testing where we're looking at usually kind of more than one gene in total um, and and you know look at it from beginning to end and takes a lot more time we're trying to change this 16 weeks is, is kind of unacceptable it's too long but at the moment um yeah that's kind of where we stand so i just wanted to compare this waitlist time and altogether referral to treatment which means referral to when someone's you know having a screen due to a gene alteration being found or having implications for treatment that referral to treatment or RTT time is about three to eight months currently in the private sector. And that's um, just to compare with the NHS, it's about five months there. They aim to have a, an RTT time of less than five months. Um, an example of a patient pathway. So the patient's referred from the GP or consultant. Uh, the consultant here reviews and, and triages referral An appointment letter is posted out to the individual or patient consult. Um, is then had with Jack nurse or counsellor and also the consultant. They see the consultant as well um, afterwards. And then genetic testing is arranged, a risk um, if you know if indicated and a risk assessment test or letter um, is, is sent following results. Next slide. So in terms of COVID-19 and virtual consultation, so one insurance company did come on board during the pandemic to cover virtual testing. Essentially, we used a new um, lab provider in the States where we um, arranged virtual consultations via remote testing. So we posted out test kits with the forms to the patient address through a secure postage delivery service. And we did a video call um, with the individual and arranged you know, saliva sample um, through, you know, I, I did it through video. Um, I could probably talk about this for quite a while, but I, I won't, um, I'll keep going. But basically I did about 20. I found them, them, them fine after you get over the kind of logistical challenges. I think it just improved access, you know, a lot, especially outside Dublin. And then people didn't have to travel. We did have a couple of, you know, issues with saliva samples and things like that. But all in all, I'd love to see this being integrated into the future. Um, and especially in the public sector as well. And hopefully that, that will happen eventually. Next slide. So I think I just wanna focus on the last couple of slides here about our role as genetic counselors beyond the test. So post-test support. So at the moment, following a diagnosis of a BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene alteration, post-test support, you know, long-term, um, it's delivered by charity or tertiary sectors. And obviously the Marie Keating Foundation is doing a great job over the last couple of years with stepping in and, and doing some of this work. And it's been really helpful. And um, this webinar is an example. Patients may be offered um, a post-test appointment or a you know, follow-up phone call after they've been diagnosed or given a difficult piece of information or bad news, BRCA1 or BRCA2 result. Um, you know, it depends on service. What I try to do is call individuals after I've given a bad news result to and um, by two weeks after I've given the phone call and then I'd kind of see how much support they would want or need and arrange future calls. Um, but we do have limitations with our time as well. Unfortunately, we can't see or talk to people every month or every three months like we'd hope. Um, so the role of genetic counselors is to also support patients post-test by signposting to relevant information resources such as the Marie Keating Foundation and cancergenetics.ie which is a really good website with lots of information that I'm sure can answer lots of questions that's been popping up um, and then we also advise further and regular psychological support um, where deemed necessary as well. Next slide. So we, what we do is we try to encourage kind of self-awareness um, about how people cope and um, we obviously try to normalize the emotional adjustment that can come with having a diagnosis of a BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene alteration. Um, you know, it can, everyone is different. Individuals have different uh, family in situations, environment, experiences of cancer in their family with themselves. 
everyone is so different. Everyone has their own way of coping and dealing with bad news, bad information and risk, which is a hard um, you know, thing to kind of get your head around and takes time. So we encourage people to, to be self-aware about that um, and, and kind of what works for them. We highlight, or we try to make sure the GP is involved as well and that the patient or individual knows that they're there for, for signposting to local counselling supports. But we are, we are aware this is a massively under-resourced area in general. Um, and just to highlight about um, health insurance, um, obviously being in private, we work with people a lot who have health insurance and there is psychological support available through companies, usually like six sessions. But I just wanted to highlight that that's, it's good for short-term help, I think, and support, but they're not trained counsellors. So trained counselling, psychotherapeutic counselling isn't really funded with health insurance. So just to be aware about that. And it's usually um, only available privately, unfortunately, or through a charity. Um, and just ongoing counselling may be more helpful for some people as opposed to the psychological support. And just to mention about HSE funding restrictions, Regarding screening and surgery, uh, we are aware that this is, you know, giving people increased anxiety and it's, we just want to make sure people know where to go for support and, um, you know, they know their friends and family um, are there as well to support them. Next slide. Um, so nearly at the end. So, yeah, like I said, what we try to instill in, in people and what I try to do when I'm talking to people after giving news um, of BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene alteration is, is about just knowing themselves, knowing what works for you guys, for, for knowing what works for, for them, what do they enjoy, you know, what um, can help them manage, what previous experience they've had with the difficult news, and how do they get over that, and what help, did talking to lots of people help, and did talking to just one person help, um, and, you know, we try to normalize it again, it's okay to not be okay, it does take a while to adjust information, um, but what we say is time does help with adjustment and, and then that does help with coping it's still difficult um, but time definitely does help um, and just to mention about group support it, it might suit some people but it doesn't suit all um, but what I would what we'd always recommend is to try new forms of support but just be gentle with yourself and if it doesn't work for you that's okay as well and then just to touch on well-being in general and um, we know it's affected by many factors um, and we're in a pandemic still and you know, we know a lot of things are heightened at the moment, but just to point out about diet and especially exercise, which I think is becoming, people are getting out and about more because there's nothing else to do. Um, but just even going for a walk every day can massively improve mental health. So we'd, I'd always talk, try to talk about that. Um, and just knowing what support you have around you and work and your family and your friends as well. Last slide. So just in summary, uh, genetic counsellors, we are here to support um, as much as we can. Our, our main role is to estimate cancer risks um, in individuals and families, help with ongoing referrals to, to screening and surgeries um, where relevant and as, help as much as possible. We try to assess well-being and adjustment and coping and, and recommend ongoing supports. We do have limitations with weight, you know, we can't control the wait times for testing and, and surgeries, unfortunately, but we are hopeful for this area in the future that, that things will improve, fingers crossed. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Jessica. So Jessica, I know we're, we're running out of time. Thank yeah. you for your time there. I would love to hear more about your virtual test pathway, but perhaps in the Q&A or another time, but um, yeah. it sounds really interesting. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Um, I'd like to call on Nikki now. Um, Nikki, um, Nikki, you're yep. coming in, I hope. I'm here, here, yeah. Okay, oh, here, there you are. Just bear with me now, because my, my screen has just frozen. Okay, so Nikki. Um, Nikki is a PhD researcher in the School of Psychology um, in NUI Galway, exploring the experience of people with a BRCA1-2 alteration um, in the Irish healthcare system. She's working on developing an online tool to provide individuals with a BRCA1-2 alteration um, the necessary information they need when managing their health in Ireland. Um, Nikki has a keen interest in genetics and the psychological impacts of hereditary cancer conditions. Nikki is based in Galway City and has worked with the Marie Keating Foundation and the peer-to-peer -peer voluntary, voluntary support group for the last three years. So thanks, Nikki, for all your support and help. Um, really um, excited to hear about the findings in your study over the last number of years. So over to you, Nikki. Thank you. Um, so thanks, Helen, uh, for having me. So we might go next slide. Perfect. So 
my name is Nikki and like Helen said, I'm doing my PhD in NUI Galway. So we might go to the next slide there. Um, so just to kind of give a little overview about what it is that I've been doing. So the last two years, I've been looking at the experiences of individuals who have a BRCA1 or 2 alteration in Ireland. And um, so the overall aim for the project is to develop a tool to kind of address those needs. And those needs seem to really be focusing on informational and knowing where to access supports and that kind of thing. So a component of this research, which we actually um, advertised at the last year's Marie Keating uh, conference, was to conduct interviews with people um, who have a BRCA1 or 2 alteration in Ireland and have gotten tested within the Irish healthcare system and to see their experiences of that. So you might just go on to the next slide there. So the aim of the project was to kind of gather the experiences of people um, with the focus being on kind of what areas uh, they found that they had good support in and, and what worked for them when they were learning to cope um, with their BRCA alteration status. But then also to look at the areas that were stressful or caused anxiety or just they felt that there could have been more support in. So the reason we did this was to inform the overall tool that we are working on at present. And it was really important for us to get that information right from the source, which was from the Irish BRCA1 and 2 alteration population. So we might go to the next slide. Perfect. So overall, um, we got 18 people to take part. And that's a standard number for this kind of research because the interviews um, with the individuals took from, it could have been between 20 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes. So we've got really great um, in-depth information from a wide range of people. And actually a lot more people were interested and that shows a really great engagement for research of this kind. And I think it also is indicative of how eager people with a BRCA1 or 2 alteration in Ireland are to see an improvement in the services and to have their voices heard. So we got the, uh, the interviews done and we then uh, thematically analyzed them. And basically what that just means is we look through all the transcripts. So we write up all the interviews, we take out any kind of identifiable information to make sure all the participants can remain anonymous. And we highlighted kind of any similarities and we looked at the themes to see what worked and what didn't work. So this project is still quite live. We're still actively looking at the results and this is the first time we're kind of presenting it. So I'm going to discuss four of the kind of key themes that I thought would be of interest to the population. But really we found lots and lots and lots and lots and there's, um, I'm hoping to write this up and that the Marie Keating will kind of share this information on their own social media. So if it is of interest to see the overall, the kind of bulk of the findings um, in the coming months, hopefully that can be shared also. So we might go next slide. So I just thought I'd kind of caveat my presentation and um, before I get into the real meat of it, to say that I will be looking at direct quotes from the people who took part. And there's kind of two ways, I suppose, that this might impact you if you have a BRCA1 or 2 alteration or if it's in your family. Um, you might find that it's nice to hear that other people have similar experiences to you, but also it might be a bit heavy, um, especially given how much bracket content you've heard this morning. So if that's the case, please do feel free to zone out and maybe come back in the five to 10 minutes. Just um, I just said I'd let people know in case it is a bit too heavy. So we might go on to the next slide, Helen. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, the kind of way we look at the output of the research of this kind is that we look at themes. So there are four key themes that I'm going to discuss here today. And one, the first one being support, the second one being meaning making, and then the third project management, and the last one being kind of conflicting medical advice. So I suppose the first two are kind of looking at positives and how people learn to cope um, with a BRCA1 or 2 alteration in Ireland. And the last two kind of being the difficulties that people face within the Irish healthcare system. So you might go next slide. So I'm just going to also caveat this one with maybe about 70 to 80 percent of the participants had really good support from their family. And I'm focusing on that here. But there were some people who found that there wasn't great familial support. And if that is the case, then that the Marie Keating peer to peer uh, support service is there for you if you feel like you can't get the support that you'd like from your family. Um, but for a lot of people, they did find that they got good support from their family and that they, it did help with their coping. Um, and I think it's also kind of a reassurance to maybe family members who are present on this uh, conference uh, today, or maybe people who have tested negative for the gene uh, alteration within their family, is that just being there for your family members who are affected by it and being open can be a really great uh, sense of support for uh, someone impacted by it. So we can see here that uh, this individual said that it was a good part of it. And, and weirdly, they said, that it was good and bad and that they have quite close relationships with distant relatives. So this individual found that 
with the BRCA alteration status, it kind of brought the distant relatives closer into the family and it created a lovely support network and just allowed this person to have relationships with people that they never would have even known about, which is lovely. So there can be kind of a way of looking at it that the support you get from your family can be a positive. You might go next slide. So then there was also just a few other quotes that I thought nicely kind of encapsulated this theme. So now in the, in, on the left-hand side there, we can see that this person said that they did have a lot of support and that was mainly down to the family kind of sending texts, phoning and checking in. So that again is something that you can do to support your family member um, is just checking in on them, just seeing how they are and so on. And again, in the middle there, you'll see that the individual here was actually quite surprised that it was a positive reaction when they rang to inform their family members of the BRCA alteration being identified and that everyone saw it as a positive and they were grateful for this family member um, for bringing that information to them. Now, again, to caveat that, that this won't be kind of what everyone experiences, but it was a nice sense of support that this person found. And then again, being that theme of being open and having a fam family that kind of will be open about it, can speak about it. And that found uh, this individual on the right hand side here found that, that was a real sense of support, that the family was pretty open and chatted about it all. You might go next slide there. So this is uh, a nice theme. I really like this theme. It's a looking at meaning making and how people kind of come to terms with their BRCA alteration status, because it is quite, it can be a life altering thing to learn that this is in the family. Um, and individuals will often find meaning from their BRCA1 and 2 alteration. So sometimes people looked at this from a kind of spiritual perspective and others more of in a practical way of looking at BRCA, uh, the knowledge of BRCA as being a tool that you can kind of have in your arsenal. So this individual here uh, on this quote said that, you, you know, it was a bit odd, but it kind of made sense of getting cancer at 37. And it was nearly a sense of relief to know that it was a genetic cause. And then she went on to elaborate about how it wasn't anything that she personally had done wrong because we can hear quite a lot of things of how to prevent cancer, but really this individual found it was nearly a relief to know that it was a genetic cause to her cancer as opposed to anything else. So this way she kind of made a meaning out of her um, BRCA uh, alteration. You might go next slide, perfect. And then, like I said before, like bracket can be seen as a tool. It's, it's that whole thing around knowledge being power and it can give more of an insight into how you can manage your own healthcare. So trying to see it kind of in a meaningful light. And then, like I mentioned, some people look at it from a spiritual kind of way and that it's out of their control. It's an act of God, really. Um, and then another way a lot of people looked at it was kind of just seeing it as something that just you inherit, but lots of people inherit different things from their family. So this person said, well, I didn't inherit the bad heart from the father's side. So this was another way to kind of make sense of learning about this big, um, this big change in the family dynamic. It was from just, I just happened to have this gene and it wasn't the bad heart, for example. So we might go on to the next slide. And these are kind of the slides or the themes that I found really interesting in regards to how um, the context in Ireland seems to be a little bit different to, in different uh, countries abroad. And these next few slides, I suppose, the other two had lots of quotes from uh, male bracket carriers as well, but also this one will probably focus more so on, on the females, on the women's experience. So project management or kind of that having to take control and being that self-management of uh, care this was a real cause of stress for a lot of people. So um, I suppose it was mainly around the fact that there isn't a real clear pathway to kind of managing your care um, in the Irish healthcare system. So I thought this quote here really grasped that really well. So I just think that if you get a BRCA mutation, that news that there can't be that many of us in Ireland and we should all be sent to the one place dealing with the same doctors, the same counselors, the same everybody. So that whoever you're dealing with is actually giving you the right advice and is actually that you can trust that you don't have to be going off and doing your own research. It's exhausting. So I think this really does kind of grasp that a lot of the time people don't have that model of care um, that seems to be so brilliant in St. James's, but this isn't really the universal um, experience within Ireland and that there really is and a lack of support from healthcare professionals, mainly meaning just that there doesn't seem to be a clear pathway um, to access your care all the time. So we might go next slide. So again, people found it hard to kind of find out the information that was pertinent to them at this time. And um, so kind of thinking, where the hell am I supposed to go now that I start finding out this information and having to organize all the appointments themselves, going through doctors, going through consultants, that there wasn't a streamlined process to access the services. And then all decisions being left to me. Obviously, as an individual, you want to make the decisions around your healthcare. But really, I think we need to be looking at a kind of a more 
a better support system where we can advocate for ourselves, but also be supported by the healthcare professionals so that they know um, what, where to send us for the different services that are needed. So we might go next slide. And this conflicting medical advice, this ties in with this because I think this just kind of highlights that if you don't have a one-stop shop basically for all the services, you're, you're more than likely going to get kind of conflicting advice sometimes and that can be hard to make sense of. So again, this is kind of predominantly uh, looking at the, the, the female experience, but when making decisions around those preventative surgeries and the screening options, lots of women found that they kind of got different information from different practitioners. So, you know, even checking the implants now after surgery, what do I need to do? Do I need to check? And his view is, oh, well, there's nothing left. You don't need to, but you know, other people have told me I do need to. So that in instance was that kind of conflicting medical advice around, should you be doing a breast self check after getting a preventative mastectomy? And really the advice is that you should, but obviously there is a bit of conflicting medical advice there. And similarly, and I think this is a topic that a lot of women will face is that issue around HRT and whether it's safe to take it. And that really is, seems to be something that came up quite a lot was that there isn't that support there to make those well-informed decisions for yourself and for managing your own care. So I might go next slide. And then this is the kind of a quote that I thought brought it all together and it is quite long. So maybe I'll just go at the first line and the last line, but kind of saying from a medical point of view, I found it kind of quite confusing. I found it very confusing because I felt like I was getting different information. So really, I think it highlights that, um, and it, it, it was highlighted in the report from the Irish Cancer Society as well, that because that centralized system doesn't really exist or it's not really, um, it, it doesn't, it's not accessible by everyone within the country, um, it then leads to this conflicting medical advice where different professionals might have different mm -hmm. standpoints or different views. And then the individual, most often the females, are left trying to make sense of this and trying to make sense and trying to make these decisions around their own healthcare for the benefit of their family and for their own health. And that can really be stressful and trying to kind of pinpoint where it is the best to get the most um, reliable and evidence-based information from. That's really quite difficult. So we might go next slide, perfect. So I suppose what am I doing with the, the information that I got and from the 18 people I spoke to who were so brilliantly honest and, and really down to earth and gave me great insight into the system. So the results from this research, I'm going to use them to directly try and develop this online tool. And what I'm hoping to do from this is to kind of create a central hub and not to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great information out there, but to try and pull all that together um, and look at improving the knowledge and the skills pertinent to an individual who's just gotten a BRCA1 or two alteration diagnosis in Ireland. So we're going to try to develop and design this, this tool to kind of provide for individuals and maybe have it rolled out to GP so that they can access, they can send it on to any of their patients who have a BRCA1 or two alteration so that they know where to go for the different services. They know what services are available to them, that they're not going straight to Google, that rather they have kind of a reliable uh, toolkit basically as to where to go for their um, information around BRCA. So we might go next slide. So I'm going to give it a plug here. So if anyone's interested in taking part, now it'll be down the line, it'll probably be four to five months before it's um, where we're looking at kind of testing it. But I'd love if anyone was interested, if they wanted to pop me an email um, and I can keep you up to date on that. Um, but I really hope that that um, kind of gave an overview about really what is it like realistically as someone with a BRCA1 or 2 alteration um, trying to actually access the systems. The sy some of the services seem to be brilliant, but I don't know, are they actually being accessed by the people who really need them. So I think we need to do a lot of work there. Things are getting better and there's lots of research and funding going into it um, more so than I think in prior years, but I think we still have a bit more to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Nikki, that is so interesting. Um, and I can feel the frustration of, I, I don't know, there was 18 people interviewed, were most of them women or was there a ballot? Was there a nice balance between men and women? No, we had a hard time trying to get men. It was, I think, 15 or 16 females altogether. Okay. So mainly, mainly women. But I, I think that is also indicative of um, women do find it really hard trying to navigate the system and probably have a lot more to shout about. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I found it quite nurturing as well. I think there's a lot of, lot of nurturing in there too, isn't there, within that study um, yeah. that, that comes out. So that's a beautiful piece of work, Nikki. Thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions around that. Okay. Um, so thanks for your time and um, we'll see you at the Q&A. Okay, now I'd like to call on um, Lisa, who's the final speaker of our morning. 
I know we're running a little bit late, but hopefully we'll be able to maybe build up a little bit of time at the end or finish at, at one o'clock as opposed to 10 to one. But I think what we're hearing this morning is so important um, for us all to hear. Um, I'd like to introduce Lisa. Lisa is very special to me <laughs> as a member of the Marie Keating Foundation. Um, I've had the privilege uh, to see uh, Lisa um, in our Survive and Thrive program, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to say anymore. I'm going to just hand over to Lisa to tell her story. Lisa, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and the floor is open to you. Thank you. Good morning all. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you all today and virtually meet you and thank you for taking the time to join um, and hear my story and a little bit more about me. I'm here today to raise awareness about BRCA because it's become um, part of my life um, chapters and I believe that if I share my story it may help many others rewrite the outcome of their story and go on to write many more chapters. My cancer is only one of them. There are many more life chapters before my cancer one. Um, that involved me meeting my husband at the age of 16, married at 24 and going on to have three children, two boys, Sean and Connor, and who are now 18 and 21, and my daughter, Ella, who's 13. I've had a long um, career in finance, which I'm currently on a break from, and I'm blessed to have lots of loyal friends. And I have one sister who's my rock alongside my mom and recently deceased dad, who I miss desperately every day. But he needs his own chapter and that would fill you with lots of laughter and tears. So I begin my story. My life drastically changed on the 24th of January 2020 when I was diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma breast cancer at the age of 45. All I kept thinking was how would we tell our three children? We were just devastated. I found a lump in the shower on my right breast at the end of November 2019. It felt just like an almond right beside my nipple. I didn't go about it until January 20, um, January 20, when I spotted a tiny bit of blood in my bra from my nipple. I immediately went to my GP who acted quickly and had a letter sent to my consultant before I had my top back on. I really felt something was wrong. So I got the appointment the following week with my consultant, had a mammogram, ultrasound and biopsy on the same day. Before we left the clinic, um, they called my husband in and told him and me that he needed to come with me for my next appointment, which would be the results in 10 days. So um, I was diagnosed obviously with the cancer. On the 19th of February, um, 20, I had a lumpectomy, which I did recover well from. I went back to my surgeon two weeks later for the results after surgery. So my cancer was stage two, grade three, estrogen positive, HER2 negative. Because of my age and the type of cancer, the surgeon really felt that the next step for me was to see an oncologist for chemotherapy. I met my oncologist on the 11th of March, 20, just before lockdown, and was told I'd need to have chemo and that I'd lose my hair within 16 days of starting treatment. I was so upset as my hair was my biggest thing. My hair used to be long, black, and I enjoyed getting a curly blow dry every Friday. I started chemo on the 3rd of April and had 12 days to source a wig during lockdown and nowhere open. Everything had to be done via WhatsApp, video calls and messages. But anyway, I got a nice wig and I was happy with it. I had six rounds of chemo, which was pretty hard going, but I stayed very positive and my motto was look good, feel good. I made the most of the good days and hid away for all the bad ones. Four weeks after finishing chemo, I started 20 rounds of radiotherapy. I found this mentally harder. I was, there was much sicker people and children um, there, which made me both upset and scared. Anyway, I finished all my treatment. I finished all my treatment on the 8th of September 20 and met my oncologist two weeks later. So my last CT scan was prestige, she said, and she was very pleased and confident that my cancer is now gone. 
I'm now on tamoxifen for the next five to 10 years. But as my cousin got diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 25, 29, five years ago, and had BRCA2, my oncologist strongly advised me to have genetic testing done. I got that appointment pretty quick. And when the letter came, I was thinking of putting it all off till the new year. My husband said, we'd been through so much that year. Did I really want to go for more testing? Anyway, um, I got a phone call from Owen to confirm the appointment and to go through a few details. So he advised me not to cancel the appointment and could I ask my cousin for her permission um, to get her results from St. James's Hospital, which my cousin did. I went on the 22nd of November, 2020 and met Owen in person and Professor Gallagher. And my world turned completely upside down um, and because of COVID, yet again, I was on my own and my poor dad was sitting downstairs waiting in the lobby of Blackrock Clinic for me to come back. I was basically told there and then I was highly likely to have the BRCA2 gene as my cousin got hers from her dad, my mom's brother. I never knew men could be carriers and that prostate cancer for men was one of their symptoms. So never expected my cousin to get the gene from her dad. It was actually worse than being diagnosed with breast cancer. The fear, anxiety and panic attacks were just unbearable. The unknown was awful and not knowing anything about BRCA, I didn't know where to begin. All I heard was preventative surgeries, ovaries and tubes to be removed, double mastectomy, reconstruction. It was a 50-50 chance of getting it from your parents, which meant I was, highly, I was likely to have, to have gotten it from my mom. And then I had a 50-50 chance of passing it on to my own children. I had to wait four to six weeks for the results as Christmas was in between. So on the 6th of January, 2021, my poor dad passed away from COVID. Dad was simply the best. He was my rock and my world. He would call in to me every single day, even if it was just for 10 minutes and always boosted my spirits. He kept me so strong and positive and no matter what I needed from lifts to all my appointments, a shoulder to cry on, collecting my prescriptions, drop in daily with my mom and bring me lunch and treats. He was my main support along with my husband, Clyde. So Christmas last year, we were in our bubble of 12 and kept it tight between my family of five, my sister, her three girls, my niece's boyfriend and my mom and dad. Unfortunately, COVID hit our bubble and nine out of 12 of us were positive from the 28th of December until the, or from the 28th of December till the 31st of January when we were all tested. Myself, my mom, my daughter, Ella and my sister were all asymptomatic. And the men, my dad, Clyde, Sean, Connor and my niece's boyfriend all got symptoms. My dad got the worst. He got a temperature um, that went up to 41.5 and couldn't get it down. It was like a living nightmare. Things went from bad to worse and eventually we got an ambulance on the 4th of January at 7.30 p.m. He was taken to Tala Hospital and passed away 36 hours later from COVID. Myself and my sister were sitting in the funeral home um, the next day, starting to plan my dad's funeral when I received an email from Jessica to say my results were ready. I couldn't believe it, so emailed her back, explained the situation and collected the results the following Wednesday morning from Jessica, which were BRCA2 positive. Jessica has been amazing and so supportive since I got my results. My breast surgeon actually said he'd never read a more informative letter and was keeping it for future reference. Jessica had an hour Zoom call with me and Clyde and my sister explaining the bracket to gene mutation and answering and explaining any questions we had. She explained the two preventative surgeries for me and the future for my kids. For me, um, men being carriers with prostate or breast cancer was new information. I always thought it was females that carried the gene. So also explained, as it was one of my main questions, how could we get the gene out of the family for the, my children's future? There is a couple of options. And the way, main one for me, because I hopefully want to be um, 
and Nana in the future would be if my kids with BRCA were starting a family that they could do IVF. On my mom's side of the family, she is one of 13. Three siblings have passed already from cancer. We don't know whether it is genetic as they're not here. We must have at least 70 cousins between first and second cousins. So it's important to get educated and get as many tested. Unfortunately, there is that difference between private and public. Thank thankfully, I have private health insurance, so I didn't have to wait long and most of the fee was covered. But if you have no health insurance, you can pay privately, which is approximately 800 euro, which might not be an option or else wait 12 to 18 months for a public appointment. This is so wrong for, um, and the big, for the, that big difference. In fairness, it's like living with a time bomb when you've just been recently diagnosed. And for me, prevention is better than cure. So I've had a full hysterectomy six weeks ago and I'm recovering well. I'm so relieved my chances of ovarian cancer has reduced from 60% to 1% less than the normal person. I'm booked in to have a double vasectomy re reconstruction in October and this will reduce my chances of breast cancer returning to 10%. I can't wait to have this done so I can start living a somewhat normal life again. In fairness, I have had so much support from my husband, my children, my mom, sister, nieces, and a wide circle of amazing friends. There isn't a week goes by where I don't get something through the door from flowers, Prosecco, candles, dinners, afternoon tea, pampering gift sets, cards, the list is endless. I even got a, um, an egg swing chair from my garden this summer. The best advice I got in my darkest days in November was to register for the Marie Keaton Strive and Thrive. Thankfully, I was accepted and started the course at the end of January for seven weeks via Zoom. I met the lovely Helen and all her colleagues and 14 amazing ladies similar to me who all had breast cancer um, and one girl had um, ovarian cancer. We all were the same. We looked the same from losing our hair um, hair grown back, we all had the same feelings and after two weeks we all had the same understanding and started to feel really comfortable with each other. On the last week Helen arranged the look good feel good to give us a boost after the six week course. We all received a fab goodie bag and had a makeup session via Zoom. I joined in from my hospital bed the day after my hysterectomy. I couldn't have missed this evening that evening even though I didn't participate I still felt part of it all. Two of the ladies um, which are now my friends have been diagnosed since with a BRCA um, gene mutation too so we've become even more closer. If you were to take anything from today it is that knowledge is power, prevention is better than cure and ignorance only brings fear and fear serves no purpose in my cancer journey. I have a job to do, and today my job is to spread awareness and knowledge about the BRCA gene and help spread the knowledge far, um, far and wide. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to listen to my story and be, be with me today. And I'll leave you with one of my favourite quotes. Well-behaved women rarely make history. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Lisa. I know your story. Um, it's heart wrenching. It's very difficult. And, and I'm, I'm not sure how you even were able to stand up and say that today. But I know for you, it's something you want to do to share and educate people and make them more knowledgeable and know that the supports are out there too, you know, for you. So Lisa, thank you so much. I have watched you transform, as you know, over over two months. Um, and you've shown it all today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. So it's quite hard to move on from that. Um, but I suppose um, we will go into a question and answer session now. If I could ask maybe everybody to come back on. 
all our speakers from this morning and Lisa as well, if, if you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Helen, sorry, it's just Jennifer here. Sorry to interrupt everybody. It might be a nice way to start with some lovely comments there in the chat box, Helen. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, let me see now where we're at. These are for you, Lisa. Absolutely awe-inspiring, Lisa. You are amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, God bless you, Lisa. Thank you and deepest sympathies on all you've suffered. I am encouraged and empowered listening to you. Well done, Lisa. You are an inspiration. Thank you for sharing. Wishing you the best for the future. You are incredible, Lisa. I wish you the best. Thank you, Lisa. You are brilliant. Thank you, Lisa, for a powerful talk. Well done, Lisa. Thank you for sharing. Oh my God, I'm in floods here and my two sisters, we are all bracket two positive. Thank you so much. Um, well done, Lisa, thank you for sharing. Wow, well done. Sorry to hear about your dad. And, and we all offer our condolences to Lisa's dad um, who passed away on the 6th of January only this year. Thank you for sharing, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. You are a truly inspiring, beautiful lady. So how are you, Lisa? I'm okay. I'm, I knew I'd be emotional, but I didn't think I'd be this emotional. But I'm just glad um, I'm able to share my story as like so far in our family, there's been 10 tests done and eight are positive. And th three of them are sisters, which are my cousins. Um, and their dad never had to cancer he just is a bracket two carrier like my mom. So I really, really want to encourage as many people to get tested. To I think you've done that today, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so everybody is on who was on this morning. Pauline, we've got you there. Okay. So let's go into some Q&A um, and just see what, what we can. Uh, there's lots of questions here now, so I'm not sure we'll get to them all. If we don't get to them all, we will certainly be answering them online um, and we'll put them on our website. Is that OK with everybody? Um, OK, so I'll start here. Should someone with BRCA1 be having a colonoscopy yearly? Now, um, who, who could I put that to? I'm happy to take that, Helen. OK, thanks, Owen. Um, there's no evidence that having a fault in BRCA1 or BRCA2 causes an increased risk of, of colorectal cancer. Um, so in general, no, but it might be that a patient might both have BRCA1 and a family history of colorectal cancer problems as well. So it might be that some individuals are given that advice based on their family history, but for you know, the vast majority of people out there who have a fault in BRCA1 and don't have a family history of, of colorectal cancer, that they wouldn't need to be having colonoscopies. Okay, thanks, Owen. Okay, well, I, I think we'll move on fairly swiftly and just try and get through some of these questions, maybe until five past, uh, five past 12. Um, is there any impact on financial loan application like mortgage if there is a BRCA gene positive test? Um, uh, Owen, would you like to take that one again? Yeah, or? No, no there, there, there really shouldn't be. And again, um, kind of as I cover in, in my slides there, um, and again, that website, I think it's uh, insuranceireland.eu, uh, there's more information there. But um, no, insurance, first of all, they shouldn't ask about those types of questions. You don't have to disclose it if they do, uh, and it can't be held against you. Yeah, great. Um... I've just got a message there from Polly Pauline. We know who that is, Lisa. She just said, it's an honor to know you, Lisa. Powerful presentation. Just thought I'd share that as it came up. Um, and Pauline is asking, which guidelines are followed in management remutations such as CHECK2 and PAL-B2? Um, Owen or Carol? Yeah, with the CHECK2 and the PAL-B2, they're treat them as moderate risk. So the recommendation that we would give our ladies is that they would have an annual mammogram from 40. Um, and that can be done via their GP. It doesn't necessarily need to, you don't necessarily need to attend a breast clinic. And also that you need to be very breast aware and try and do your breast examination once a month on the same day. Okay, lovely. 
Anybody on, do you want to add to that as well? Yeah, I think um, the, the problem with um, a lot of, problem with a lot of the, the, the advice is that we don't have um, those national guidelines and national gene specific guidelines mm. and something we should be working on. Um, we would be quite well aligned with uh, the UK and the UK um, cancer genetics group um, guidelines. And they are, you know, they've got standard ones for BRCA1 or BRCA2, which is great, but they are working through other genes that are associated with breast cancer, like CHECK2 and PALB2. Um, we would consider PALB2 to be a high risk um, breast cancer gene and uh, to cause similar um, breast cancer risks as, as um, BRCA1 or BRCA2 or, or almost similar. Um, so we'd be giving advice that that would be on the same lines as BRCA1 or BRCA2 for PALB2. Whereas with the CHECK2, yeah, it's similar to what Carol was saying that we, we'd recommend excuse me, recommend a, a, yearly, a yearly mammogram from 40 as well for that. Okay. Brilliant. And just to add, Helen, I think Polly just asked about males. I presume she's asking for these two genes as well. Mm -hmm. There's no increased screening or surveillance we need to recommend for that. Lovely. That Thanks, for Jessica. Okay. Um, so there, there's a number of questions in here, really, like that are asking, how does one go, um, how does one seek genetic counselling? Um, and there's a few questions coming through again around outside of Dublin. So we know it's, I mean, I guess that's a little bit different in, in terms of telemedicine, but all the same, there is that question. Um, who'd like to take that? I well, you know, you in a position, Jessica? Yeah, I guess, I guess that question in terms of genetic counselling and genetic testing. So I'm not sure if they're talking about just genetic counselling and not genetic testing, but I suppose genetic counselling just usually comes with someone getting a referral from their GP or their consultant um, to one of the genetic services to talk about their, their risk of cancer uh, with regards to the family or with regards to something that was found in the family. And that's when they have a genetic counselling appointment kind of pre-test or to see if they want to have testing or not. Um, and then any follow up, you know, will be arranged then following testing. So in terms of just genetic counselling, I think that's a service that we could improve. And like I mentioned in my talk about limitations with time and things, um, but we are here as services um, and Owen can echo that. If anyone did feel the need, they did want to have a, a follow up consultation and Owen, you can probably follow on from me there. Sorry, Jessica, I just didn't hear the end of what you said there. Just for Owen, if he wants to add anything as well. Okay. Yeah, I suppose anybody, I suppose anybody out there who has, um, you know, has a, a family history of there being a fault, either bracket one or bracket two, they are eligible for genetic testing through the, the public service. They do not have to pay. Obviously, the only issue is around the waiting time that we currently have. So with that, you know, we encourage people to be referred in as, as soon as possible. Um, and, you know, as early as possible, we, we can't test children. We only test people who are over the age of 18. Um, and again, there's no mad rush for anybody to be tested at that age unless they really want to find out because the screening doesn't normally start till 30. Um, but, you know, people can be referred in at younger ages, like at 18, you know, so that they're on the waiting list that they are seen. Um, I suppose we would hope to get the waiting list down further. But, yeah, your GP is your, is your port of call for most people in that position. If you have a diagnosis of cancer yourself, it, it's a discussion maybe to have with your oncologist at the first point port of call to say, look, th is there any reason for me to be seeking genetic testing from, from that side? Okay, brilliant. Um, there's another question here. How effective is screening versus risk-reducing surgery? That's a fairly big question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you're thinking about that, so I'll, and Carol, I think I'll, it, Carol, maybe I'll start with you. I suppose in terms, it depends, like it's different for both. So for the oophorectomy, the screening, as we've already said, is, is not very sensitive. So you can be having transvaginal ultrasound and the CA152, and they could be normal and there could be something there. The screening with regards to breast is much more sensitive. You know, you have a, a both MRI and mammogram surveillance. Like obviously the point of surveillance is not to prevent something, it's to catch it at the earliest possible time. But even in terms of risk reducing surgery, it doesn't eradicate the risk completely in terms of risk reducing mastectomy. Mm -hmm. You know, so I suppose the, uh, it's how long is a piece of string? It's really what's the best for that person? You know, you need to look at it from an individual perspective. For some people, risk reducing options, they're not interested. And surveillance from a breast perspective is absolutely sufficient. 
as long as they understand that it is for surveillance and not for prevention. From an oophorectomy, we, we, there, are very, there is very good evidence in terms of, you know, the risk, risk reducing or the risk or reduction of cancer and better outcomes in terms of lifespan. So, I know, I suppose it is really very specific to that individual person. The age as well, I guess, with yeah. any side effects from oophorectomies yeah. or menopause is quite a big one yeah. that can... Yeah. And like obviously in terms of the risk reducing options, we need to have, particularly for oophorectomy, there needs to be something put in place in terms of managing those side effects. Because my experience, you know, on the breast aspect of it, my experience is from a gynae perspective, it's really, really poorly managed. And myself and my colleague end up managing quite a lot of that. And in terms of life, that has a massive impact. Yeah. 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 Um, I notice a lot of the questions that are coming in may well be answered in the breakout sessions are kind of a lot of clinical questions so i suppose i'd just like to quickly go around the room um for a closing remark from from each of you if that's okay carl can i start with you just what the day what the day meant to you i suppose we live in our little bubble in james's and we we feel we have a good system and listening particularly to nikki's report you know god we need to do a lot of work mm, a lot and of work to be done yeah, absolutely. And I suppose myself and my colleague are very passionate about it and we will help as much as we can to try and drive the national strategy. And I'm sure Pauline is totally on board with that too. Pauline, you're next. Uh, where am I? Thanks, Carol. Yes, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Just echo Carol's sentiments entirely. And uh, as well as that, I have uh, BRCA members in my own family. So very passionate and we'll do everything we can. Okay, to thanks, Pauline. Things. Jessica. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to the Marie Keating Foundation, I think, for the support they provide to women and men who have BRCA gene alterations. I think we'd be a bit lost without them, to be honest, as a genetic service. Uh, we're all, you know, the referrals have gone up. We're all, you know, busy out the door. And I think without them, it would be quite difficult. So thanks so much for hosting this event. Really appreciate thanks. it. And I've definitely learned a lot myself. So thanks, thanks Jessica. Lisa thanks well. for that. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'd, I'd have a shout out to, to Bernie Carter, as Assistant Director of Nursing, who actually manages that service very well, um, together with the communications team. So thank you for that. Owen? Um, I'd echo what Jessica was saying there as well. I think, you know, as an organisation and even with the peer, peer support group, I think you're just doing fantastic work. I suppose it makes me reflect on the fact that we have such busy waiting lists um, it doesn't just take away, it kind of takes away from this, from our point of view as well, in that because we are so busy clinically, you know, we don't have as much time as, as we probably should do for the post-test counselling side of things, the, the working with support group side of things. And again, you know, we, we want to be part of that. But when you've got such, you know, when you've got a year waiting list and you're, you're, you're really trying to bring that down, that's where that also kind of makes us suffer a bit from that side. So I think you guys and being a strong advocate group is, is brilliant. Um, and again, you know, as you know, anything I can do for you guys, um, anything we, we will work together to, to kind of to move things forward. And so it's just a special word for Lisa as well. Lisa, thank you very much for, for telling your story today. Yeah, thank, thank you. Nikki? Yeah, I hope my internet, it's crashed twice. So hopefully oh, won't. okay, didn't yeah. notice. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, I suppose, again, just to thank you for, first of all, for the people who took part in my research, which was advertised last year at the conference, um, really for helping me kind of tell the story of the Irish uh, experience. And then for the Marie Keating for letting me um, share it. I think when I'm writing up, it's taken me a long time to write up the results, mainly because of a lot of the stories are very difficult. And I think we have to face that within the Irish healthcare system. We're not really doing our people with BRCA, with Lynch syndrome, with any other genetic mutation. They're not they need more we need more um mm -hmm. and i hope that i can kind of put my foot down on that without being um too harsh because i know the people in the system are really trying their best it's, it's the lack of funding the lack of resources but i hope with conferences like this and, and with lisa who told her story so beautifully that kind of thing i hope we can raise awareness and really try to improve our services and try make it a better experience for anyone impacted by it Lovely. Thank you, Nikki. And thanks for all the work you do for us and the Marie Keating Foundation, too. It's it's very much appreciated. Lisa, can I can I give you the last word? And um, one thing I suppose I would like to say is I'm sure your father would be extremely proud of you today. 
Um, and we like, you know, we're in awe of your story um, and certainly remember your father on a day like today. Well, I think he's given me the biggest um, push to, to do what I'm doing because I don't know where I'm getting the strength from and it has to be from him. He's with me here beside me today and I know he'd be encouraging me to raise awareness because when I walked out of Bracka Clinic after meeting Owen and Professor Gallagher, he actually said to me, what do you mean it's you, how you might have this gene? He said, um, I thought you were going for that appointment for Ella. He said, what's this mean for us as a family? So we we didn't know. And like to raise such awareness and hear um, there is support there, um, especially for my family, which is a really big family. Um, you know, it is important. So um, like my cousin that was sick 20, you know, or got diagnosed five years ago. She's really sick now. So um, we need to offer all our futures and have. Yeah preventative surgeries and know that it's not scary <laughs> thanks folks. thanks lisa well your story you, is so folks. real and in times of covid so vivid isn't it yeah, yeah 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 thank you so much for sharing i really appreciate it thank you okay before we go and i'm sorry we are running um um uh what should i say behind time i should say um i just want to um, let you know who's speaking in the breakout sessions and just give you a little bit of um, housekeeping around that. So um, we have the lovely Yvonne Amaro, who's a systemic psychologist and psychosocial oncologist. And Yvonne has worked in the area of psychosocial oncology and palliative care since 2014 in Ireland and in North America. Um, and she's re recently taken up a lovely post in University College Dublin um, as a women's cancer survivorship research coordinator um, based in the Matter Hospital. So Yvonne, we look forward to um, seeing you in the, in the breakout session. We have Karen Sage, um, and Karen is a, has a master's in genetic counseling and is the UK's first specialist genetic counselor in fertility. She works alongside Professor Alan Handyside, um, founder of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD, um, as it's well known. Um, and she's a lead genetic counselor at the Bridge Centre in London. Karen was then invited to join the care facility group to set up and lead the genomic services across the network of IVF clinics, um, including Beacon Care Facility, facility in Dublin. And Karen is a specialist in genetic counselling of patients undergoing pre-implantation genetic testing for inherited conditions, including BRCA1 and BRCA2. And she's a founding partner of Fertility Genetics, where she provides independent consult consultancy herself. And then we have Dr. Shirley McQuaid. Um, Shirley is a medical director of Dublin Well Woman Clinic. Shirley is a graduate of Trinity College, um, and she trained as a GP working in various posts across Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, and Australia before returning to Dublin. She has specialized in women's health. And over the years, she has contributed to training programs with the Irish College of General Practitioners and is a member of the British Menopause Society. So no doubt you'll be hearing a lot from um, Shirley about menopause. So I think that covers our breakout sessions. Um, you will have, you'll need to leave this session and click into your afternoon link for the breakout sessions and you've been automatic, automatically assigned to that. If for any reason um, you can't get in, and, and I suppose, um, Ava, you might give me a shout there as to what time we'll start the breakout sessions as we're running late. Um, we can start at around 25 past to give people just a little bit of time to maybe go to the bathroom and get a cup of tea if needed. Okay, so we'll start at 25 past. Um, and then like when you're in your breakout session, You'll have your, we'll have, you'll have a lead person from the Marie Keating Foundation, lead nurse, um, and you'll have your, your speakers. So if for any reason you do want to leave that meeting, um, you, there is a, a blue button on the bottom of your right hand screen. That will bring you back into what we call this room or the plenary room. Um, Karen Gaynor will be there. Um, and Karen is a, is a psychotherapist who, who works with individuals. So if there was anything that was bothering or upsetting you, um, you can always come into that room. Liz Yates, our CEO, will, will be there too, to just um, help, you know, be with people and, and to have a chat if that's, if that's what's needed. We will reconvene um, back in, in, the, in, in, the same, in that same room, in that same link um, for closing remarks. 
and actually to just ease us back into um, our own home environments um, without, without having too abrupt an ending. And I'd like to thank um, Rachel McKeown for that piece of advice actually from last year, because again, we all feel that everything, you know, we're together for a couple of hours, everything ends abruptly, and then we find ourselves in a very isolated space too. So on that note, we're going to leave you and we look forward to seeing you back in at um, 12.25 in your breakout sessions. Thank you so much, everybody, for speaking this morning, um, for sharing your stories, for your expertise. Um, we've all learned a huge amount. Thank you.